radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. All right. How you doing? Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Uh, Yeah, man. How you doing? It's Monday. Monday, March 4th. 2019, 63 days into the new year, just 302 days left. As always, we are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of beautiful downtown Burbank, California, and I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west. North and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I am your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? That's the question. It's all good. Kicking off. A brand new week here on Fade to Black. An amazing show tonight. Very special guests, Greg and Dana Newkirk are here. We're going to be talking about their new docu-series, Hellier. I binged it over the weekend. And after tonight's show, you will be binging it too. It is called Hellier, available on Amazon. Also, uh, Hellier.tv. All right. Tomorrow night, Mitch Horowitz is here. Cannot wait for the conversation with Mitch, and he will be arriving in Los Angeles on Wednesday night. So tomorrow night, he's with us. Wednesday, he's en route to Los Angeles. We'll be talking about all of that tomorrow night. Wednesday night, very special broadcast. This is our Soul Tech special event. We will be launching our website and everything to do with Soul Tech 2.0 2019. And also, we will be featuring the premiere of our documentary. It is called Boarding Benevolence. All of that happening on Wednesday night. Thursday is another fader night. Open lines all night long. All right, so kicking off this week tonight... Greg and Dana Newkirk and their new series, Hellier. So we'll be doing all of that in just a few short minutes. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio, at J Church Radio. The Sandbox, all that conversation that goes down each night is hashtag F2B. And any questions or comments during the show tonight for myself or Greg and Dana, hashtag F2BQ. Of course, we have two chat rooms. One over on Spreaker and one over at KGRA, the planet. Okay, now you can also email throughout the show, jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Let's get to all the breaking news. We've got a lot of it going down right now. And uh, so we'll start off with Luke Perry. Yes, uh, earlier today he left this earth after suffering a massive stroke. He was just 52 years old, and he's been a part of this generation since the early 90s, and it's just absolutely incredible. Recently, he was uh, starring in Riverdale, um, but uh, 52 years old, absolutely incredible, and so much great stuff from Luke over the years. But I will always remember his part in The Fifth Element, 
And that opening series of scenes in The Fifth Element with Luca was absolutely incredible. Rest in peace, Luke Prairie. And then also today we got the announcement, prodigy frontman Keith Flint was found dead at his Essex home in the U.K. That happened earlier today, and he was only 49 years old. Oh, incredible. Incredible. I went today, just like everybody did, uh, I went and, and watched uh, a bunch of uh, Prodigy. And uh, just absolutely unbelievable, 49 years old, of an apparent suicide, and they are not looking at the death as suspicious. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, Keith Flint. Absolutely incredible. Incredible. All right. Other breaking news. Penn State. That's right. That Penn State is planning to establish an international research center dedicated to the search of extraterrestrial intelligence, their version of SETI, an initiative that would be one of the only few academic SETI research centers and would offer a graduate program training the next generation of researchers. The university announced last week the first two donations totaling $3.5 million dollars towards creating the Penn State Extraterrestrial Intelligence Center. Incredible. Incredible. State College, Pennsylvania. It's going down. And get a degree, right? (laughs) You get a degree in searching for a graduate program for searching for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Incredible. Incredible. River Moon Coffee. All right, scientists. Now, this this is about as mind-blowing as it gets if I'm going to do some breaking news. Scientists have managed to give mice infrared night vision for up to 10 weeks using only a simple injection with no side effects, raising the possibility of future human use. Listen to this. Described in a paper in the journal Cell, the nanotechnology works inside the eye, binding with retinal cells and translating faint light that the mice's eyeballs, should be mice, or is it mice's? The mice's eyeballs couldn't detect into electrical signals. It works by converting the light into shorter wavelengths at the green end of the spectrum so the mice see infrared light as green, similar to night vision goggles. That is no joke. Incredible. Incredible. Now, Europe needs its own technology to guard against a growing threat to its satellites from space junk ranging from dead satellites to tiny particles. They are getting around 100 alarms a day about approaching particles, and every two weeks a satellite has to dodge something. This is all according to the ESA, the European Space Agency. The threat from thousands of dead satellites that circle the planet is manageable because they are large and easy to track. Makes sense. It's the 900,000 particles of over a centimeter in size and the 130 million that are over a millimeter that are far more dangerous. Now, check this out. This is going to require Europe work with international partners because... Of the 114 satellite launches in 2018, only eight were European, compared to 39 that were Chinese, 34 from the United States, and 20 that are Russian. And that's all of your breaking news for today. The Surfer Music streaming app is now available free for download. Just go to the banners at jimmychurchradio.com or go to S-U-R-F-R dot F-M. That's surfer dot F-M. It's super easy. It's fun. And all you have to do is download it and start listening. Things couldn't be more simple. The Surfer Music Streaming app. It's all that I use. I can show you right now. I'll show you right now on my cell phone. Right? 
It's right there. Surfer. Boom. Done. And that's the app that I use right there. Surfer. It's incredible. It's going to kick off here in a second. I better turn that off so we don't have music streaming during the show. Surfer.fm. Don't have to give up your email. You're not going to get contacted. All you do is download a streaming music app. It couldn't be easier or more simple. So cool. Surfer music streaming app. S-U-R-F-R. Okay. Our next event is Contact in the Desert coming up May 31st through June 3rd in Indian Wells, Palm Springs, California at the Renaissance Indian Wells Resort and Spa. Tickets and info are at contactinthedesert.com. We have a full weekend of events. Of course, we're going to broadcast on Friday night, Fade to Black. Saturday night, I'm hosting the awards dinner. You've got to get tickets for that separately. You can get that at contactinthedesert.com. And Sunday night, I'll be doing the closing night ceremonies and panel. Contact in the desert.com. And then this Wednesday, we will do our special Soltech 2.0 show. That's this Wednesday announcing our 2019 Soltech conference, which is over the July 4th weekend at Sunrise Ranch in Loveland, Colorado. You can sign up for tickets and info at soultechgathering.com. This Wednesday, we'll launch the full website so you can uh, get your tickets. And also, we will uh, be premiering our documentary. Okay, so all of that goes down this Wednesday night, our 2019 Soltech Conference over the July 4th weekend in Loveland, Colorado. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. It is just $2 per month. Go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on that podcast banner. We have over 1,000 shows. Over 1,000 shows for just $2 per month. You can also become a fade or not over at our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. You can get those autographed shirts, hats, all that fun stuff, commercial-free downloadable archives, MP3s, and all perfectly crystal clear and uh, compressed and oh, perfect audio. Okay, you can get all of that over in our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Don't forget to visit all of our sponsors here. Ancient Life Oil, Life Change Tea, River Moon Coffee, Hoffman's Optics, Numana, uh, Emergency Food Storage, uh, Sacred Skulls. Visit all of our sponsors here at jimmychurchradio.com. Of course, surfer.fm. Okay, let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today, Catherine O'Hara. That's right. Catherine O'Hara today is 64 years old. Of course, we know and love her in Beetlejuice. Best in show for your consideration. A mighty win. So funny, so cool. Catherine O'Hara today is 64 years old. Our dead guy's birthday today is Antonio Vivaldi. 1678 to 1741, died at the age of 63. Of course, virtuoso violinist who wrote the popular The Four Seasons Violin Concertos. Happy birthday to Vivaldi. Actually, he has one name. Nobody says Antonio. It's say Vivaldi. On this day in history, OTD 1994, John Candy dies of a sudden heart attack while filming Wagons East in Durango, Colorado. Tragic day on this day in 1994. Fader fact. In the United States, okay, are you ready? In the United States, installing traffic lights cost cities between $250,000 and $500,000 Per intersection. <laughs> I'm in the wrong business. You're in the wrong bit. Five, 500 grand. How can you be a one stoplight town? $500,000. Put up a stop sign. $500,000. Think about that. Tonight, very special guests, Greg and Dana Newkirk, are here. We're going to talk about their new series, Hellier, which I did binge over the weekend. It's a five-part docu-series. I got lots of email, and there were the posts on Twitter and Facebook. You know, everybody go and check this out. Well, I did. 
And you should, too. And we're going to go through all of that tonight uh, discussing Hellier. It's absolutely an incredible documentary series, and it's available on Amazon. That's H-E-L-L-I-E-R, Hellier. We've also got the links for it over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Tomorrow night, Mitch Horowitz is back. Wednesday night is our Soul Tech special event. Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Also this Wednesday, March 6th, is the world premiere of Boarding Benevolence, our Soul Tech documentary. It's really cool. And the trailer's available. We've had that up. You can go and check that out. But the movie is really, really good. Okay, now, my fast River Moon coffee. Why does it taste so good? Uh, I, I At this point of the show, I want to stop the broadcast and just sip River Moon Coffee, Faded Black Blend, tweet, hang out. I wish I could just do that. You know, jump over in the chat rooms and just, just drink River Moon Coffee. Because that's what this sip does. <sighs> Incredible. Okay. All right. I... Yes. Two, 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 two. I guess our bunker cam is down. It's working on YouTube. Drew is working on it. He, he can't figure it out at this point. But, okay. All right. So that's the latest update from Drew. My fascination with the UFO subject started when I was very young. And I was like eight years old. A little bit before that. But the real stuff happened when I was eight. Fourth grade. And my best friend at the time uh, was John Dubrava. Still lives in Chicago. <laughs> don't 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 hunt down John, but he's out there. I've talked to him, and he sat next to me in Mrs. Laverty's class in fourth grade, and we would sit there and and draw spaceships, draw planes, and flying saucers, and we pretty much did this all day long. You know, we were we were taking. Class, I mean, we were in fourth grade, but and we were doing the things that we needed to do, whatever, you know, math and English and stuff. But all day long, man, stacks of drawing paper, notebooks, book covers, all that stuff, drawing, drawing those UFOs. That's what we did, you know, and then we would go to the library. We would read everything that we could find about our space program, moon bases, UFOs. And each week we would watch Space 1999, right? And on UHF, uh, there was the program uh, called UFO. Equally as good as Space 1999. Space 1999, a little more high tech. And I thought that that was, uh, I don't know. It was kind of a toss up because. UFO dealt with UFOs. Man, I love that show. Both out of England, by the way. Really, really good stuff. Anyway, uh, we were all in at the time. John DeBrava and myself. Well, over the next four decades, I've always felt that these craft and those that pilot them, you know, are coming from deep space. Another solar system within our own Milky Way and and for the most part, I still do believe that this is the case. But over the last 10 years or so, and certainly over the last six, things for me are starting to change somewhat. Now, first, first, more data and science is starting to come through. And I talk about it often on the show. And there is all of that, all of the science, whether it is, uh, you know, hard science and then you have physics, not only here on, on Earth, but the astrophysics and the study of, of the cosmos. There's that. But there's something else. And that is, the more that I talk to different researchers from different fields, like cryptozoology or Bigfoot and religion, you know, ghosts, channeling, remote viewing, time travel, right? Science and parallel worlds, space, astronomy, history, whatever. And, of course, ufology. It's the more that everything seems to overlap. Everything seems to be connected in some way. I have done so many interviews now. And when I came into uh, broadcasting, I had, 
I had a view that was at that time somewhat changing, that I felt that UFOs were possibly interdimensional or possibly that some UFOs may even be us, you know, time traveling from the future. There's there's that element. And I felt that there was something else going on other than just a straight spaceship somehow getting here from interstellar uh, space. You know, and and as as the years have gone by and pulling me up to today, there's there's something else going on. Everything is connected. If you think about it, Angels, demons, reptilians, you know, flying craft, ghosts, channeling time travel, parallel worlds, you know, and and contact with something other than us. This is nothing new. I'm not planting a flag here. It's been talked about going back thousands of years, and it's always been here with us. We've talked about it constantly at every level of society Every every civilization, everything on this planet has been talking about all of these subjects. Strange things in the sky are not some modern thing. It's not. It's not since the Wright brothers or hot air balloons knew. No, this goes back. It goes back. And, and information and, and stuff from the stars and the heavens Right? Ghost, the afterlife, parallel worlds, time travel. This has been talked about for thousands of years. So today, where we have the technology, for the most part, for the very first time, to find out what is going on from the quantum level, you know, the very smallest of the small, all the way out to the edge of the known universe, you know, the biggest of the big. We are finding some of the answers to the questions that have been around for a very long time. And one of them is that everything is connected from that atomic level all the way to the farthest galaxies. So for those that have wondered why Bigfoot can survive in the forest and never be captured or, you know, we haven't found a body yet. Well, maybe just maybe Sasquatch is something interdimensional. Or how a UFO can just appear or disappear in seconds, right? Ghosts. We know time travel is possible. There's no question about it. And how could all of this play into all of the paranormal and supernatural events that seem to happen to nearly everyone every day all over the planet? Remember the big footprints that we found at East SETI, up at East SETI Ranch last August? Well, there were just four. And the biggest, the clearest one was the first one with the other three, you know, curving to the right. But there was nothing before or after those four. It was like Bigfoot just appeared, you know, just appeared, took a few steps and then poof, gone. I can't explain that. I don't know. The only thing that, and I've always been a skeptic on Bigfoot. And when I see something like this, like evidence of the possibility of Bigfoot walking through this field, where are the footprints that were before it? Doesn't make any sense. The first one is the clearest. Shouldn't there be something else from before? There wasn't. And then it just curved off and then stopped. Doesn't make any sense. Well, I think that one day, and one day very soon, we'll find out that it's all connected and and that it's very simple. And we can all just kick back and go, well, makes sense. You know, okay, we can move on. And what I mean, what I mean is this. We'll all be able to accept that all of this is just a normal part of our lives, right? The folding of space, time travel, parallel worlds. And that, to me, is disclosure. You know, think about it for a second. Once something is figured out, and I say it all the time, once one domino falls, and that we find out when you have physicists discussing things at the quantum level and interaction and entanglement 
And that goes off into quantum mechanics and and infinite parallel worlds and the interaction in you know between them. That's at a scientific level of research. But that's our research too. That's what we're looking into here. And Einstein and time travel and time loops, right? Whoa. The interdimensionality of everything and how that ties into space and how quantum uh, particles can react and entangle with others flying out to different places in the galaxy, in the universe. It's like, wait a minute here. That answers a lot of questions, not only with uh, space and and travel and uh, um, uh, interstellar travel and faster than the speed of light. It answers a lot of those questions, but it also starts to connect to the the electric universe and and channeling, telepathy, communication uh, at faster than the speed of light. All of this goes back down and is interconnected and goes right back to everything that we are dealing with today, which is the afterlife and ghost and parallel worlds and 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 ET and the interdimensionality of not only uh, craft that seem to appear and disappear. I, I've seen it myself, and I can't explain what is going on with that. It doesn't make any sense. It's an unbelievable time to be alive. And all of this goes right to our guest tonight, and that is Greg and Dana Newkirk. This new series, this docu series, uh, goes starts at one place, starts at one specific spot, and where it leads them. We're going to discuss all of this tonight. Is touching upon everything that I just discussed right now, and it's all wrapped up in in one docu series. And it it encompasses all of the guests that I've had on Fade to Black. It's all starting to make some sense. Not to say that some of these craft are real nuts and bolts craft traveling space. Okay, I'm not suggesting that at all. And I'm also not suggesting that Bigfoot quite possibly could be a species that doesn't want to be detected. And he's firmly planted here and he's just hiding from us. There's that too as well. Then there's all of the other questions that lay out there. So tonight, our guests are Greg and Dana Newkirk. Their new docu-series is called Hellier. We'll be discussing all of that. And the links for Hellier and Weird HQ, their website, are over at jimmychurchradio.com. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. We're on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. I'll be right back after this short break with tonight's guest, Greg and Dana Newkirk. Stay with me. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. 
Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hey, folks. Guess what the number one phrase that Life Change Tea receives by email? You ready? We love this tea. We love this tea. Time after time, week after week, we love this tea. Life Change Tea gives you more energy, a beautiful cleansing, and fulfills its slogan perfectly. The tea that makes you go. So if you want to be on your health game, log on to GetTheTea.com and order Life Change Super Strength Tea. Packages come in a one-month supply, and when you brew this stuff, wait until you see the results. Aren't we all about the results? And with a lot of people's health struggling, we can use a little bit of help. Doctors will tell you, disease starts in the gut. So log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Be our next email saying, I love this tea. I mean, I love this tea. Get the tea at getthetea.com. Helping America one tea bag at a time. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Do you want to lose weight but have no idea where to begin? The Fast Start Diet, a three-day weight loss plan, is the answer. Three days of nutritionally balanced, calorie-restricted meals delivered right to your door. No shopping, no measuring, and no cooking. Everything is prepared for you and ready to eat at home or on the go. The Fast Start Diet has all the amazing benefits of intermittent fasting without starving. We've helped thousands of people who have struggled to reach their weight loss goals. Isn't it time we helped you? With the Fast Start Diet, you'll lose weight and feel great. Find Fast Start Diet on Amazon or go to faststartdiet.com and use promo code TALK to get 10% off your first box. And as a special bonus, Fast Start will include their number one rated LiPo3 appetite suppressant spray free with your order. This is Jimmy Church, and whatever your diet plans are, do what I did. Go to FastStartDiet.com. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guests are Greg and Dana Newkirk. Can't wait for this conversation. We will be discussing Hellier, which stars Dana and Greg, and directed by Carl Pfeiffer. It's a five-part cinematic documentary series that investigates a new and intriguing supernatural mystery. What began as a plea for our help, from a frightened man harassed by what he believes are extraterrestrial forces leads to a small crew of paranormal researchers to a dying coal town where a series of strange coincidences covers a decades-old mystery with implications as deep and far-reaching as the caverns beneath Appalachia, which I've been to, by the way. Now streaming on Amazon Prime, and the links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Greg is one of the world's only full-time paranormal researchers and has spent the last two decades tracking down and investigating cases of the strange and the supernatural and conducting groundbreaking researchers research on everything from alien abduction to poltergeist hauntings. Dana is a practicing hedge witch. That's right. With well over two decades of experience in seeking out the strangest cases of the unexplained. Dana began her career by forming the first ever all-female paranormal investigation team in the late 1990s, the subject of Space's girly Ghost Hunter series. She has been featured on uh, the Learning Channel's Kindred Spirits and Destination America's Paranormal Lockdown. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, Greg and Dana Newkirk. And welcome back. And uh, before I say, what have you guys been up to? Well, obviously, we know the answer to that now. 
<laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic to be here, man. And it's, it's it's so good to hear your voices, and and the series is pretty extraordinary. And before we get to that, and I do want to dive into it uh, pretty quickly because there's so much uh, to cover. And even though this is a three-hour show, we always run out of time. And there's so many uh, different uh, paranormal and supernatural things that go down in this series that uh, it's uh, it's like a two-part show. But we'll get as much of it done as we can. There's one thing that I, I, I kind of want to start off here is that um, before you two got together, I'm I'm going to actually focus or uh, uh, push this towards Dana first, Greg, okay? But before <laughs> you two got together, you guys were actually on the same type of career path in that you guys were very young, and you and your friends are going into the paranormal world. You know, both of you were doing the same thing. And in the beginning of the first episode, you say, Greg, that you, you've you been doing this for 20 years or whatever, but the first five years don't count. <laughs> right? And now, I want to throw Ac- that. Right, yeah, right. And we're we're going to discuss that. But, Dana, do you have the same story? Do the first five years, are those... Are those eeks nade from the uh, from the CV? I think so. Yeah, I mean, the first five years for me was really trying to figure out what exactly we were looking into and what we were doing. So there was a, sort of a lot of um, a lot of test testing and kind of just messing around and getting scared and going to places that you know we thought were, was haunted and it was just sort of a lot of that kind of stuff. So I like to consider the first five years sort of my prep for uh, uh, me kind of then becoming, taking it a little bit more seriously. How old, how old were you at, at the beginning of the, uh, the paranormal journey? Early teens? I, I actually was, I'm a little bit older than Greg. So uh, <laughs> I was probably about 18, about around 18 when uh, I first kind of formed girly ghost hunters and yeah, we were kind of like a group of young ladies that were just really into the paranormal and really into kind of investigating it. So uh, we would just kind of go out to all of the local places where I grew up and, uh, you know, investigate them looking for activity. Well, everybody's got the uh, uh, the story of the, the house in the neighborhood that's haunted, right? Is that what you guys did yeah. first? Absolutely. Well, originally, our our big thing was cemeteries because, you know, you could go there at night and you didn't have to ask permission most of the time, or at least we didn't ask permission. But um, yeah, we were always into like looking into the finding whatever place in our uh, in our town was sort of like had that had that story attached to it. And we wanted to see whether or not it was legitimately haunted. But yeah, we were totally looking looking for that perfect Stephen King haunted house. We, uh, I'll say this, uh, cemeteries freak me out during the day, <laughs> right? That, that's, they're scary. Right? Yeah, yeah, they're scary. And I have never and never will go to a cemetery at night. You're just asking for it. You're asking oh, that's for a challenge. Yeah, man. yeah, you're asking. <laughs> I mean, why, why volunteer yourself for it? I mean, it's just crazy. But there, when I was growing up, uh, there was... Uh, there was the, there were woods next to our junior high school, uh, PS 103 in Indianapolis. And you can go and look and, you, and the woods are still there. And there was this concrete, like asphalt, uh, pathway that cut through the woods. You could cross 38th street and, and take the back entrance to the junior high school, which is where I walked every day. Right. But in these woods off to your left, uh, when you're walking towards the school, was a house, an abandoned house. And it wasn't an old house. It was just like a suburban brick home that had all the windows knocked out of it and was sitting out there in the woods. And I'd walk by it every day. And one day after school, me and a couple of friends decide to walk over. And, you know, everybody said it was haunted. And I walked in. I've told the story before on the air. And I walked into the living room. And on the floor, which was wooden, was a burnt, my memory says it was burnt, it was black, um, uh, pentagram with a circle. 
and it was like 10 foot mm-hmm. in diameter, right? Right in front of the fireplace. And I'm like, man, uh, I'm out of here. I'm out. I didn't, <laughs> I, I, I did. And so, uh, I never went back. You know, I was. You're supposed to light some candles and lay down in the middle of it. It freaked me out. And this was, <laughs> this was, I'm going to say 1974. Now, what a wasted opportunity, right? So there you go. <laughs> but we've all got those houses in our neighborhoods, don't we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and for you, Absolutely. Greg. Absolutely. Yeah. For you, Greg. Okay. Let's switch over to you because this is where this story uh, kicks off. You had your little uh, crew of friends uh, that were doing this, and you guys uh-huh. had the vision of starting a website. Oddly enough, uh, this is the first five years of your life that 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 uh, aren't of the professional realm, but it turns out it's the reason for this series. Yeah, we uh, you know, we were just a bunch of 12, 13-year-old kids and we watched too much Buffy the Vampire Slayer and X-Files and Unsolved Mysteries and that kind of thing. And we started because we were going to go and take one of our friends into the cemetery and we had our older friends hiding. And this dates it a little bit because they were making like the uh, Blair Witch symbols with twigs and they'd set the cemetery up with fishing line and stuff like that. And uh, we had such a good time scaring our friends. And we thought, well, let's start going to cemeteries for real. And the first time we did was this cemetery, this mining cemetery out in the middle of nowhere. And we had so much activity that we we immediately went, oh, my God, monsters are real. We can actually we can actually hunt these things. So we started reading books by Hans Holzer and the Warrens and all that good stuff. And then we uh, – we we started a website. We started a really crappy GeoCities website with the GeoCities page builder and these pictures of us with medieval weapons and it just re- absolute absurdity, ridiculousness. And uh, we we it became something of a of a small cult following in our high school because everyone wanted to know what kind of adventures we were going on. And uh, one thing led to another, and we were just out every single weekend, sometimes on weeknights, sneaking out of the house. I had to wear my soccer cleats because my dad used to check the shoes out in the uh, front room because I snuck out so much. Oh, that's, that's funny. Really, <laughs> that's what started it. That's and, and eventually, as we went, you know, we realized things got a little more serious. And um, you know, as these things tend to do, everybody grew up and everybody went to college, and people got jobs and lives and. Ghost Hunters Incorporated just sort of dissolved, but the website sat there, and uh, we just kind of kept it up for a while, and anyone who found it found this uh, website run by what looked like a bunch of teenage kids uh, with battle axes. And I know the the pictures are are pretty cool, and this (laughs) is all laid out really well in in Hellier in in the first episode, and and we're going to stay right here for a second because it is truly key. And uh, truer words have never been spoken, and that is when you least expect it, right? When you least yeah. expect mm-hmm. it, and and that's what happened here. Um, but uh, the idea for Hellier, um, how did that actually come about? In that um, you were sitting on all of this data, which we're going to go through uh, right now. You were sitting on all of that. Did you think it was going to be a series? Or were you just documenting, you know, this, this, you know, this investigation? Uh, no, we, we had no intention. Um, you know, it kind of just stalled out and the, where we had left the case was there just wasn't a whole lot that we, we felt we could do with it. And, you know, we got really busy and we started to do, uh, you know, we were working for a startup here in Cincinnati working 14 hour days and we just didn't really have time to pursue much of that type of stuff. And when the idea of to do the the series came about was actually our friend Carl Pfeiffer. Uh, He was listening to an old radio show I'd done where I was talking about the case. It wasn't anything new. He just had found it and was listening to it. And as he was listening to me talk about this case, uh, he was on Twitter uh, just tweeting about it. And in the feed, he sees an article from our website, Week and Weird, that we had written years and years ago, uh, post about this case in Hellier. 
And he kind of messaged me and was like, hey, you know, good timing, you know, uh, thank you for throwing that up. And I was like, dude, I didn't do that. He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, we have a, uh, an app on the website that just takes old content, evergreen content, and churns it to the top so it doesn't get lost. And it randomly picked that while he was listening to this radio show uh, out of like 1,700 articles or something. And it was just this strange synchronicity that Carl said, OK, I think something's telling me we need to go do this now. I think this is the right time. And I mean, we even kind of fought him a little bit because we we didn't know exactly what we were going to find out. And it, it didn't seem like a, a very sure thing. Uh, but he insisted. And so a few months later. He showed up in Cincinnati, and he was the first person we ever told the name of the town to. Now, this is uh, – I want to throw this at Dana um, because Greg just mentioned the key word here, at least for me, a- after uh, I have watched all uh, five episodes, that this series, which is about the supernatural and, and UFOs and E.T. and ghosts and paranormal and goblins and – Every, but it's not about that. It's about chasing and identifying synchronicities. That's what this series is about, and 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 following your intuition. Yeah, I mean, it was undeniable once we, as a group, arrived in Hallier, and all of the synchronicities were lining up over and over and over and over again it was undeniable at that point to not recognize that really what we were doing was investigating this phenomena this phenomena of high strangeness of of just weirdness that might not make sense in the moment but as you continue kind of going further and further and further down the rabbit hole things start to line up and things start to make sense and what at one point in time seemed incredibly strange suddenly is, uh, you know, an important piece of your investigation. So, yeah, we, it was really the synchronicities were really what were kind of driving us forward and, and giving us direction. And at, at a certain point, they were happening so often that we just decided, I mean, let's follow it. Let's run with it. It was, uh, it was the most fun part of, of this was uh, you guys recognizing these events as they started to pop up, which seemed to be endless. But it's recognizing it and and following up on it. And what is sad is how many people go through life ignoring synchronicities, right? And not not seizing the moment and going and chasing after something. Uh, they choose to just ah synchronicities. Come on, you know that's that you know. <laughs> and if you guys didn't do that, there would there would not be a hell year today. Yeah, they no. they were. I mean, they were the road uh, signs for us. They were what were pointing us in the directions that we uh, we would run in. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the more that you embrace them and the more that you recognize uh, the sacred cities in your life, the more you start to experience them because you're sort of in the phenomena at that point. Okay, so now let's go. Let's go back, Greg. Uh, you guys go and do your separate ways, the original crew, right? <laughs> Ghost Hunters, Inc., yeah. I think is what it was called. <laughs> And, yep. and uh, you guys go your separate ways, but there was an email link that stayed live on this GeoCities website, <laughs> and you we, decided to check your email one day. Yeah, we. Uh, I was living in Canada at the time. Um, Dane and I had kind of hopped around the country, and this was about... Uh, what was this? 2012. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hopped around the country, and Dan and I had done the on and off thing, Um and an event, it was my turn. So I was in Canada. I was going through Canadian immigration. And, uh, you know, GHI had, had been dead for years. Uh, the website just kind of sat there. Uh, occasionally, we got some emails to it. Some Most of the time, it was just people who thought that we were from the sci-fi channel show Ghost Hunters. So one night, my uh, email dings. And it's actually the Ghost Hunters Incorporated email. And I thought, well, that's interesting because the subject line was uh, something to the effect of urgent need help please respond and uh, I opened it up and it was from this guy he said his name was David Christie and he laid out this story about how there were these creatures coming out of mine shaft on the edge of his property in Hellier Kentucky which is a very rural coal town uh, in eastern Kentucky 
and they were tapping on his children's windows at night. They were uh, doing weird things like taking the wreath off of off of his door and shoving it in his mailbox and going through his uh, his his storage shed and frightening his family. Uh, the guy seemed to be very terrified. And I initially kind of brushed it off because I thought somebody was playing a trick on me because there was no reason for an email to go to this email account. Uh, one of the things that he said is he said, our, our mutual friend told me to contact you and said, you're well equipped to handle these things. Anyone who went to that website would know right away. We were not, we, you didn't, didn't see that website and a bunch of kids holding, you know, torches in, in bowling shirts. Yes. And right, go, right. These are the guys to handle this problem. <laughs> I need some 15 year olds uh, on my case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So it didn't make any sense. Right. I thought, okay, one of my friends is putting me on and. Uh, I responded much the way I do to some of the crazier emails we get, and I just said straight-faced, well, listen, that's really interesting. We'd love to help. Um, you need to give me some more details. Uh, do you have photographs of these things? Give me some evidence that this is happening, and we'll do our best to find some help for you. Now, I want to I want I want to jump in at this point. Uh, the question that you're going to answer in a second is, how long did it take him to respond? But I want to say this, that letter, which is read in its entirety um, in episode one, literally sent chills down my spine. That That's was scary. a pretty terrifying letter. It was pretty extraordinary, especially the parts uh, about his daughter and, and what was happening at the bedroom window. Uh, and and so for everybody, when you go see Hellier, pay attention to that that letter, um, and the entire thing is read. Okay, so how long did it take for him to reply? Uh, it didn't take too long, I, if I remember correctly. It only took like a week or two, right. and he responded uh, and actually sent photographs of these three toed footprints uh, that were coming from the 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 creek that led to the mine shaft by his property. And that was when I went, oh, maybe something's going on here because they were striking photographs. Uh, the first thing we did is I took them and I posted them on my Facebook account and I just asked my friends, uh, you know, doing this long enough, you know, you meet lots of interesting people. That's one of my favorite parts. I know tons of people who are experts at stuff that I am not an expert at. So I wanted to see what my friends who you know worked in nature thought about these things what my bigfoot hunter friends thought about these things and you know no one could seem to figure out exactly what made them but what was really interesting was the bigfoot hunters in particular were really caught up by these things called dermal ridges uh, they're one of the things that bigfoot hunters look for in their tracks to see if the tracks are real or fake and these prints had dermal ridges, which are basically like um, they're like fingerprints for the for the foot. Clear as a bell. And, Clear oh, as yeah. a bell. I couldn't believe yeah. well, I, when they popped up. I was like, well, look at that. I see fingerprints. Yeah, absolutely. They were. I mean, and it's 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 like you said, clear as a bell. It's right there. Um, but they were really striking three toed prints the likes of which I'd not seen before. Uh, some Bigfoot hunters said they looked reminiscent of some of the Bigfoot tracks that they've seen, but they were much, much smaller. Uh, so the first thing I did is I emailed him back, and I said, well, okay, you've got to tell me more. This is really interesting. You've got my attention now. And then uh, it wasn't too long before he sent me a whole other set of prints. And this time they had uh, like a measuring stick next to them. And then he also sent me photographs of what he claimed were the creatures. These ones weren't quite as striking. Uh, they were in, in typical paranormal fashion, very blurry, hard to make out. Uh, but if you look at the photos, it looks like the one of them looks like something peeking around a tree, a little tiny pale figure. Uh, with like an arm that looks like it's reaching around a tree. You can see his and shoulder. One, you can see his shoulder, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can see the shoulder. You can see the round head, yep. and it almost looks luminescent, which is a really interesting detail because uh, what we started to compare this case to was the case of the Hopkinsville Goblins back in 1955 on the other side of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, they These creatures were said to be luminescent, like they glowed. So that was a really interesting detail. The the whatever this thing was in this photo looked like it glowed, 
And then there was another photograph that looked like a side profile. And the side profile, when you lighten it up, looks quite a bit like your typical gray alien. You can kind of see the high cheekbone, uh, the big black eye, and the the pointy chin. Uh, and he had taken these after he had already fled his home. Oh, that's left right. We home. we left out we left out that detail, right? So he was there and uh, with his family, and then when he wrote back, he said, "You know what? Had to split." So me and the family have yeah. left. I came back for a few days, and and I took these pictures, and I'm sending them to you now. Yeah, and he had gone back with his uh, I think his brother in law to collect some of their stuff, and sure enough, they came out of the out of the forest. So he sent me these photos and I said, okay, I'm in, uh, you know, I, I'm stuck in Canada right now. I don't know when I'll be able to get down. Give me your address. Give me your detail. Give me a phone number, anything, uh, because I'm, I'm very interested. I, let's, let's do this. Let's go. Now, when and was the never ne- heard from him again? That was my question. When was the next time you heard from him? <laughs> never again. That was uh, it. Okay. it just dr- dropped off the map. Crazy, crazy turn of events here. And all of the photographs are pretty compelling. And what we have here now, we're going to pick up when we come back. I'm going to head towards a break. But what we have here now is what appears to be a UFO case, you know, an ET contact case, because those look like grays, right? That's what it looks sure. like in, in the pictures. Um, he says they're coming out of these caves. But for me, at this point of Hellier, We've got us a UFO encounter of the third kind. And where this goes next, yeah, it gets crazier and crazier and crazier. Our guests tonight are Greg and Dana Newkirk. (coughs) Excuse me, I just coughed without the cough button. Talking about the new series, Hellier, which was directed by Carl Pfeiffer. It's an amazing story. We'll be right back, and we'll pick up where we're leaving off right now. It's Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Introducing the new Surfer Music app. Listen, fade or not, you know I love my music. This is my go-to for all things notes. The Surfer app is a brand new concept in music listening. Surfer is free, providing unlimited access to thousands of live streaming radio stations. Surfer is an exciting interactive listening experience. Discovery and surprise are built right in. Surfer is your destination to discover and rediscover great live streaming music. It features high quality audio streams, free access to music from thousands of live streaming radio stations, unlimited listening, unlimited skipping. You get a music visualizer and you can also select your favorite channels. Get it at the Apple App Store or Google Play. Just search Surfer Music or click on the Surfer banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Folks, this is very important information. What's to be said about CBD? AncientLifeOil.com Our CBD is made from hemp and has .003 THC, which means this wonderful product won't get you high. No matter what amount you take. What does CBD do for the body? My hands are tied. But you can Google CBD benefits and be astounded. When you're finished reading... You'll want to log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com and purchase. Life is good when you feel good. People are tired of pain. People are asking for non-GMO organic products to help them with, (laughs) you fill in the blank. Legal in 49 states, and again, our CBD is made from hemp. Ancient Life Oil is about helping people one by one by one. If you wonder how good the product is, the CEO takes it every day. Without miss. Ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Have a great day. Hello, I'm 
Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. Well, the, <laughs> just, you we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Reclaim your active lifestyle with Angioprim. Angioprim is the original liquid oral chelation supplement. Chelation helps remove toxins, heavy metals, and cholesterol in your veins and arteries that can cause blockages. Scientific research proves the active ingredient in Angioprim has superior oral chelation action that helps promote cardiovascular health. Find out more. Go to angioprim.com. Talk to a trained consultant by calling Angioprim toll-free. 877-882-7221. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hey, it's Grace. Can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. At jchurchradio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. You can follow Dana and Greg. They've got at WeirdHQ on Twitter and Newkirk, which is... uh, Greg, how do you spell Newkirk? (laughs) <laughs> it's a play on words n-u-e-k-e-r-k okay you can follow greg right there and we've got it all up on twitter this is where uh, i, I want to go to next in that everything is connected right john keel talked about it and of course uh, keel is referenced uh, throughout uh, the documentary series but everything is connected but at this point you guys are going into it at the top of the curve here, you know, with only the letter and these photographs. I want to ask you, Dana, where did you think this was headed at this point? I I think for me, I had kind of personally gone through a bit of a roller coaster with it. So initially I was really skeptical. Then when we received the photos, you know, it, they were pretty incredible. And it was hard to deny that there was something legitimately strange going on. Uh, going on. So I was hoping that what uh, what would happen is that we would be able to find this person and sit down with him and have him give us his uh, not not only what he had already told us kind of in a face to face capacity, but I I wanted to know what was going on and what had been going on uh, since he had, you know, stopped emailing us. Well, and you, you come from the paranormal side of the fence. So were you leaning towards something crypto, uh, something of that nature, or were you thinking E.T.? 
I think initially my brain instantly went to the kind of cryptid space. And that is mostly just because, uh, you know, the footprints I have, we had a little bit of experience at that point in, uh, the Bigfoot space. Right. So for me, the footprints, they were this kind of tangible piece of evidence that I could sort of lock into and focus on. Uh, so yeah, initially I was really in the headspace of sort of that, again, that cryptid space. Uh, but that, that changed as we continued, uh, along on our investigation. And how, how about you, Greg? Where were you leaning? Oh, a hundred percent cryptid. I, you know, one of the things that David had mentioned in his emails was that he believed that the creatures were extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. And uh, while that's interesting to me, you don't typically, when people talk about cases of abduction and uh, close encounters, you don't typically get footprints with those types of things and so i i just thought that somebody had put this weird idea in his head that it was extraterrestrial um maybe it was some kind of cryptid maybe it was some sort of a you know kind of like the 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 lizard the bishopville lizard man or whatever um that's where my head was at if it wasn't just someone trying to pull our leg uh it was kind of a toss-up between then uh between those two and it wasn't really like dana said it wasn't until we actually started to get into hellier and talk to people and see what kind of experiences we were having that our minds were changed on that. Now, Hellier uh, was another synchronicity, too, as well, that popped up uh, with uh, all of you, including Carl. Um, Very strange how the word gets mentioned uh, when you hadn't said anything uh, in social media about the location, Mm -hmm. right? It was... uh, To just give a bit of backstory here, we, in 2013, uh, we started to shoot a web series. And on that web series, we were going to tackle a bunch of of different things. So Bigfoot, uh, alien abduction, we hung out with vampires, like you name it. We want to do the weirdest stuff possible. And the whole idea was, you know, engage the strange. So we were going to just go all at it. One of these episodes that we shot was we wanted to get abducted by aliens. Yeah, we talked and about so we that. Look- yeah, we talked about that last time you were on the show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one of the places that we went to was we went to Brown Mountain, North Carolina, where people have seen these strange lights. No one can seem to figure out what causes them. There's stories of alien abduction there. We thought, okay, this is our best bet. If we go here. We've got the best chance of getting abducted. So we went. Uh, <laughs> we hung out with our friend Micah Hanks there. And one of the things that, you know, he'd mentioned there, there's a, uh, this, this person told me that there's a underground alien cave base here. You want to go look for it? You know, I, it was just a fun thing. Like he didn't take it seriously. We didn't take it seriously. And we found this cave opening and that was that. So we finished the rest of our shoot. We get back home and then an email pops up and it says, why did you stop when you were so close? One week. And it was from a guy who called himself Terry Wrist. Uh, obviously, a, a play on Terry Wrist, terrorist. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, well, okay, you know, we get weird emails quite a bit. Um, okay, fine. We'll see what happens in a week. A week later, I got another email, and it said, Hellier was just a symptom. The door is closed. The window is open. Use the numbers. And there was an attachment and it was a photograph of a slip of paper that had a series of numbers written on it. We thought at first, again, like we did with everything, we put it on Facebook. What is this? What does this mean? Um, There were a few other little phrases and words on there that we couldn't quite figure out some symbols, but somebody said, Oh, that's a credit card number. So we took it down immediately because we didn't want, we didn't know what this was for and we didn't want, you know, to accidentally put someone's banking information online. But it wasn't until a few hours later, another one of our friends uh, said, no, 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 no. That is a, that's a GPS coordinate. And the GPS coordinates went to Brown Mountain where we had just been recently. That was what scared me for the, for the first time in the case because we had never told anyone the name of the town. We'd never said the name of the town anywhere. We were very careful about that. And for someone to know where we had been on Brown Mountain was a little disconcerting. So that was the first time in the case that I felt really nervous. Uh, and the only reference I could find to this Terry Wrist character 
was in a, a, a series of books. Uh, there were two books that came out in the early 90s by Alan Greenfield. Um, pretty obscure by, by normal paranormal standards. Uh, it was basically about how to summon UFOs and speak to UFOs using an old code uh, that Aleister Crowley had been given by IWAS, this uh, extraterrestrial intelligence in Egypt. Uh, and it was, I mean, super fringe by, by normal standards, not the type of stuff that I had ever really studied or looked into. And the only reference to this guy is in the appendices of these books where there's an interview between him and Greenfield where Terry, using a pseudonym, talks about going into these underground bases and cleaning out uh, the aliens in them. Terry was supposedly, according to David, our mutual friend. Now, so I have no idea who this is. And 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 Dana, at this point, your your feminine spidey sense, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what what was that telling you uh, about suddenly people knowing about Hellier, people knowing about where you were with Micah Hanks? Uh, you've got uh, 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 cryptography coming over with with coordinates, and of of course these emails going back to 2012. It's it's starting to get a little bit creepy. Uh, what were you thinking? I, at this point, pretty much every red flag that could be flying was flying. My instincts were telling me that the the what we. The situation was changing dramatically, and like on top of that, I'm I am uh, kind of a chicken, and so <laughs> I yeah I went into like full paranoia mode, and right. it it it's it's so it's super invasive, and in that moment, that's really what it felt like. It felt like someone was just letting us know how easy it was for them to kind of know what we were doing, or or it felt kind of sinister. It had a sinister kind of vibe to it. Yeah, so, yeah, it was really scary. Certainly, because you guys know what you're doing. You know, privately, mm -hmm. it's your personal life, and you guys are together, and you're discussing these, but suddenly, other people know too as well, and you're not yeah. discussing this, and that's got to throw up the red flags. And it only gets crazier, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. At this point, looking back to that moment um, and how how terrified I was at that moment, I, I would love to go back and talk to myself and be like, strap in. <laughs> this is just the, t the, the beginning. <laughs> totally, totally. Now, uh, what happens next? Because at this point... You now have the town. You've got uh, David Christie. You've you're been contacted by Terry Wrist. Uh, you've probably reached out to uh, Alan uh, Greenfield at this point, too, as well, I'm assuming. Um, and you're starting to put the pieces together, but you've got to start to plot and, and figure out what, you, what you're going to do. What happens next? So what we ended up doing was... Uh, Again, one of these weird synchronicities, we ended up moving to Cincinnati. I mean, one of the problems that we had investigating the case was that we lived in Canada and I was going through immigration. Well, we got offered out of the blue crazy great jobs working for a tech startup here in Cincinnati, and it was just too good to say no to. So we ended up moving to Cincinnati in 2013 and uh, we had a weekend. We'd finally gotten a set of wheels. And uh, I looked at Dana. This was probably, what, 2015 at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? That weird case with that guy, David, that's only a few hours from here. It's like four hours. We could go out on a weekend and just spend a day. And let's just poke around the town. Let's see if this was something that – actually could have happened you know we we were the whole time it always bothered us like if somebody was pulling our leg that was a lot of effort to put into it so we drove out one weekend and as soon as we got into hellier we said oh my god this could have actually happened here uh we we posted up at the local uh, gas station which also served as the post office and the pizza shop and the grocery store and we, any good paranormal researcher will tell you, find the town hub and then just start asking questions. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, I, I took photographs of the prints. 
I took uh, any information I had on the case in, in a folder and I just started talking to people and showing people. And no one had seen anything quite like that. People had heard stories. Some people had found three-toed footprints while they were hunting up in the woods, uh, up by where there was a series of caves. Uh, everyone was very friendly. They were willing to help. They had seen they, – people had tons of Bigfoot stories, tons of paranormal stories. Uh, and at one point, there were maybe two dozen people had come down – to the gas station because they'd heard that someone was there talking about this. Oh, you were the biggest thing in that town in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, there mm -hmm. really no was not much going on. <laughs> right, right. Now, there's one other and thing here that I want to point out to the audience, that this part of the country is nothing but one giant cave system. It's it's yes. It's yeah. huge. I, I vacationed there when I was a kid. I went down there with my Aunt Carolyn, and we did the whole thing, Cave City, uh, Mammoth Caves National Park, and I personally went into probably a dozen different caves, massive, massive, massive caves, and, and this system is, is quite huge, and it's part of Hellier, right? Well, that's actually one of the most fascinating pieces. So we started, you know, David never said the word goblin. That was something that we came up with because it the, the parallels to what David was experiencing uh, were so close to the Hopkinsville case. Everything from, you know, the, the farmhouse that was besieged by these creatures. We we started to think, well, what if it was the same type of thing? Uh, there were stories people were telling us about UFO sightings over this town, UFO as big as a football field, uh, government men coming to town telling them don't talk about this, you know, what you saw was a satellite, yada, yada. Same type of stuff that was happening in Hopkinsville back in the 50s. So we realized the Mammoth Cave System runs the length of Kentucky mm -hmm. and even up through the Appalachians. It is the largest cave system in the world and is, for the most part, pretty unexplored. Yep. So the idea was, what if there was some kind of a connection with caves here? These things are coming out of caves. We found uh, all these cases all up and down the Appalachians that talked about creatures coming out of caves, uh, particularly creatures that were uh, tormenting people. Uh, you know, it just because of the regional differences. You know, somebody in one part of the Appalachians was calling them Tommyknockers or Holler Goblins. Uh, they just didn't realize people were experiencing this phenomena all through that cave system because they'd all given them different regional names. Right. So that was our first inkling that something bigger was going on. And it wasn't just Hellier. It wasn't just Hopkinsville. It was something that was massive and seemed tied to the cave systems. And there was uh, one one guy from the town I thought this was really, really interesting, where he said that this giant spacecraft was above the town all day long, that thousands of yeah. people saw it, and it was in the local paper, and and they just stood out there and watched it all day. That was pretty interesting. That was really crazy, and one of the things that uh, – what happened with this was people – came to town they said government people came to town after this happened and told them no what you saw was a satellite it was something uh i think it could have been they, they were saying it was like a google project but these people said the stuff that they showed in the news the stuff that they told us that we saw was not what we saw they said listen we know that people think we're hillbillies out here but i know what i saw and it was not a satellite so there was something strange going on with that now, uh, did you ask about a David Christie? Oh, that was the like, first mm -hmm. question. Have you ever heard of a David Christie? Do you know of anybody, a doctor in town? Because uh, he was supposed to be a doctor. He's supposed to be a doctor. Um, yeah. Nobody had ever heard of that name. How big uh, is they said, how, you know, how big is Hellier? Oh, maybe a few miles, and it's mostly you know just little haulers. All this, all the roads in Hellier. The reason they exist is because they used to go to mines. Right. That gives you kind of an idea of what this place was like. So and there weren't a ton of people. It was close knit. Yeah. Well, uh, how big uh, are we talking? A few hundred people, a few thousand. How big is Hellier? I would say a few hundred. To right. be honest, it, it's really, really small. It's really, really isolated. 
it's not really on the way to anything. So it's just sort of tucked away. Um, and it's just sort of a small, small, small community of uh, people that have either been living there for a long time. Their families mm-hmm. have been living there for a long time. But it's really, really small. A, a couple hundred, easily a couple hundred. So everybody knows everybody. There's no question about it. Exactly. So this this no. guy, David Christie, if he's a new guy in town, everybody's going to know who he is. Right? Mm-hmm. That, that's what I would mm-hmm. think. For sure. um, and that didn't seem to be the case, did it? No, nobody knew this guy. Um, you know, one of the people that we ended up talking to was a guy who lived in the town his entire life. He was like in his 80s. And he said, I've never heard of a David Christie, and I don't even know of a doctor who lives around here. So our next course of action was to, you know, ask about properties and ask about where we should go and look for, uh, you know, a house that has this or this or this or something. My my biggest question was, is there a house around here where there's a mine shaft on the edge of the property? And the people laughed at me. Everyone. There were mine shafts on the edge of everybody's property. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, but you apparently find the house, right, so where you we, guys are driving up did, the road. We followed uh, the stream. We followed one of the one of the water sources because in the photos that David sent us, uh, there were there was like a stream, a creek, and that was where the footprints were taken. So we thought, okay, let's find a water source. Let's follow the biggest stream. So we started following different streams, and eventually, uh, right as the sun was setting, we found a house that matched the description perfect it's still uh when all this stuff had happened to david's family it was around christmas time there were still christmas lights up the house looked like it had been abandoned for three years the lawn wasn't mowed there was still stuff out on the porch it had the porch light it had the 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 shed in the background uh and it was right next to a a mine so we thought holy crap this is the place because there were a lot of different places but nothing fit the bill like this and it was so exciting because it looked perfect. So we uh, we made note of where this was. And because the sun was setting and because it was only a day trip, we said, OK, we're going to come back and we're going to do some more digging on this place. So and what, that's where we had left it. That's right. What happens next? And also, I, uh, I want everybody to watch the series, of course. But there was a comment that you made. I don't know if it was you or Dana when you were out in front of the house. Um, where apparently it looked like it was abandoned rather quickly. There was still, yeah, I mean, right. Absolutely. Yeah. There were, I, I, there was still the way the house looked, it looked as if someone had packed up in the middle of the night and left. And like Greg said, you know, there were still, uh, Christmas lights hanging on, on exercise uh, equipment exor- on it, the porch. Yeah. Like it's, it looked as if somebody grabbed their clothes and their valuables and left everything else and just completely abandoned it. Do you think it's possible um, that David Christie did live there? He lived there for seven months and that he could have gone unnoticed in the town that maybe he wasn't a doctor for the town um, and then left and nobody remembered him being there or that they didn't want to talk about David Christie and and what happened and why he left i think either one of those is fair um people in these types of places you you typically move to a place like this if you're not from there because if you're from there you generally stay there places like that and if you move there you're moving there because you want to avoid people it became pretty apparent to us uh the more we we dug into this that uh if David Christie was a real person. That was not his real name. Mm -hmm. We don't think that was his real name. Uh, Could he have been a doctor? Yeah, maybe. But when we would ask around, everyone seemed to think it would be ridiculous that anyone who was a doctor would intentionally move to Hellier. So I think it's it's a toss up there between people not just not wanting to talk about this and between somebody going there to specifically be off the radar. Pretty creepy setup to uh, this story, and this is just the beginning. Uh, So you head back to Cincinnati. We're going to head towards a break, so we'll set up for when uh, we come back. You go back to Cincinnati and regroup. Do you immediately pick up the phone and call Carl? 
<laughs> no, it was it was Carl. I mean, our lives had gotten it was like a month or two after this that we were actually invited to shoot an episode of Finding Bigfoot. And then everything just spiraled out of control. We were doing uh, different guest spots. We we had started the museum. We were on tour with the museum. We just didn't have time to go back right away. It was actually Carl who, because of his synchronicity, reached out and and basically forced us to do this. Uh, he he really, really made a play for it and said, "There's something's telling me we need to do this. It's calling me. We have to go. That's why we went back. And uh, w- 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 with Carl, and he's in Colorado, right? Yes. He, he's up in Loveland, yep. uh, Colorado. You're in Cincinnati. Was yep. there logistics planned? Or at this point, because it feels like to me, in the documentary, give me the inside of this. It seems like in the documentary, you guys are now reacting to those synchronicities. You guys didn't really have a chance to, to, to like sit down, schedule Excel spreadsheet, budget, you know, and and do do something real and plan. <laughs> you guys are now. No, we- you guys are reacting to the situation on the fly. We didn't know what the project was going to be. You know, we we've been friends with Carl for a while, and and he's a fantastic researcher. Uh, he was one of the resident investigators at the Stanley Hotel, which is just the coolest job ever. You just ghost hunt for a living. Mm-hmm. And so we knew we wanted to do something together. Uh, but when Carl settled on this, it was really just a matter of weeks when it was like, okay. We we don't have anything going on with the museum. We have no exhibitions for the next like two or three weeks. This is our window. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it then. And so Carl grabbed uh, his friend Connor and his friend Rashad and they drove out. And it was literally that we we they came out. I slapped down the file folder. They were the first person outside of Dana and I to see the original files unredacted with everything. And we just said, let's go for it. Let's get in the car and go. Now, and that's how it started. At this point, uh, uh, you know, Connor and Rashad and uh, Carl arrive in town. Any contact with Terry, Terry Wrist, or or David, or even Alan Greenfield at this point? Nothing. I mean, I had emailed back and forth with Alan for his thoughts on the case quite a bit uh, when the original emails had come in, uh, and a few times over the years. But nothing. There was there was no we had not broadcasted that we were doing this. We didn't tell anyone we what we were doing or where we were going. Um, it really did happen pretty much on the fly. And uh, the only impetus to doing it was Carl. Carl was just dead set and said, we're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do this. That's it. OK, let's take a break right here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church tonight. Our guest. Greg and Dana Newkirk were talking about their new docu-series that's directed by Carl Pfeiffer, and it's called Hellier. It's on Amazon. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com ¿Qué tal mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Cartanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. 
Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go back Lee Tappy. Do you want to be an official Fade or Not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Introducing the new Surfer Music app. Listen, Fade or Not, you know I love my music. This is my go-to for all things notes. The Surfer app is a brand new concept in music listening. Surfer is free, providing unlimited access to thousands of live streaming radio stations. Surfer is an exciting interactive listening experience. Discovery and surprise are built right in. Surfer is your destination to discover and rediscover great live streaming music. It features high quality audio streams, free access to music from thousands of live streaming radio stations, unlimited listening, unlimited skipping. You get a music visualizer and you can also select your favorite channels. Get it at the Apple App Store or Google Play. Just search Surfer Music or click on the Surfer banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com If you have hard water, the lime scale not only leaves white spots, it clogs pipes and breaks down appliances, costing you hundreds of dollars in energy and wear. Eliminate lime scale and other water issues like brown staining and bad odors with HydroCare water products available from Wave Home Solutions. Wave's affordable water systems don't use salts or chemicals. You'll love the way your water tastes, smells, and looks. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. to black i'm your host jimmy church and our guest tonight greg and dana newkirk and we're discussing their new docu-series that was directed by carl pfeiffer it is called hellier it's on amazon easy to find and also hellier.tv and it is streaming there now i want to go to the first meeting that you had with the crew with carl collin and rashad uh, as you start to disclose the evidence. And for the audience, I want you to describe the creature. Because the creature, um, well, I want you to describe it. Because it, it, it kind of fits the alien grays. But then again, it doesn't. So let's start with the face and the eyes. 
the way that it was described by David was uh, uh, it was actually his children saw it first. I think it was his daughter that s- described them as the the naked kids who were bald like grandpa. And they had a round head with uh, these uh, – he described the eyes as black and oily. And there weren't the the ears. There wasn't much of a mouth or a nose. Uh, it, it sounded like a typical gray. But as he, he continued to describe the rest of them, they only stood about three, four feet tall. And they uh, totally, totally nude, and they hopped when they moved. So they didn't walk like a person. They hopped. And the creepiest detail to me is the way that they chattered to one another. He said they sounded like skunks, which is a really specific noise. If you've never heard a skunk before, I don't think most people have, if you've never heard a skunk before, l- just look it up, Google skunk noises, and it's it's chilling because it's really creepy because I can see it in my head. Mm. And uh, he seemed to think they were afraid of the light. Yeah, I, 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 almost like chirping or squeaking. Like like chirping, yeah, yeah like yeah. a chirping, chattering type of noise. Now, and, and also uh, the nose or the lack of. Yeah, no nose, uh, no real facial features other than the eyes and uh, just kind of the the small mouth. Dana, what were you thinking? Uh, You know, because the description is obviously we get, I keep using the word creepy, but that's exactly what's going on here. And I thought that the eyes were kind of uh, cat-like, E.T.-ish, but also just a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, the... That description to me sounds like a typical gray. It sounds like you have, you know, large eyes, you have that sort of same shaped head. They're they're relatively smaller, but it's those little details like the hopping and the the chattering sounds that kind of set it apart a little bit from what we traditionally would think of when we think of kind of gray aliens. And so it it was a bit, you know, it was sort of again, much like with everything in Hellier, you you have what you think is the reality. And then, you know, there are all of these little details that kind of set it apart. So for me, the description really does sound very much like a gray, uh, but there are all of these little tiny details that kind of surround it that really set it apart from what we already know uh, or what we would, we know about grays. And what a great name for a town for a documentary like this. (laughs) Right. I I mean, right. (laughs) So spooky. It's so spooky. I mean, it's, it's just like too perfect. Okay. So now you guys sit down down with the team and you're starting to show them the details uh which also includes uh the photographs and and the letters and emails uh what was their take what was their reaction i think it was interesting because uh again we had not shared the unredacted files we had posted stuff online but we'd never posted the name of the town we'd never posted uh david's real name uh so immediately you know, I I remember Carl looking at it and being like, oh, wow, this is where we're going. This is it. Uh, it. It had been a mystery to so many people for so long. And we had held these things so close to the chest because, uh, you know, for people who don't operate in, in the paranormal, I'm sure it's this way in, in lots of other industries. But, um, you know, uh, details and information is currency in this community. And if we had let that slip... I'm very certain that it would have ended up on, you know, two or three uh, low budget paranormal television shows at some point. Somebody would have beat us to the punch. And if we had if we had given those details up, uh, we wouldn't be able to investigate the case without it being tainted because somebody could go. Somebody could set something up. uh, Somebody could pose as 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 David Christie. Even now, uh, it was it, it didn't take a week until Hellier had been released that somebody made a, a fake David Christie Facebook profile. So that type of thing is what you have to be really careful about. So I, I think it, at that moment, we watched Carl and Connor have this moment where they realized, okay, this is serious. We're really going to go do this. And Connor, uh, we're going to discuss this in just a bit, but 
Uh, Connor has got some pretty unique abilities to himself. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting guy, right? Uh, tell us about Connor. I, I love Connor. He's probably <laughs> like the most sweet, pure person I've ever met in my entire life to the point where I almost feel bad hanging out with him because I don't <laughs> want to corrupt him. Uh, Connor is a really cool dude. He's, uh, he's had two heart transplants and He'll balk if he's listening to this. I'm sure he's he's going to balk at me saying this, but I think Connor's a psychic. He's he gifted. Quite... Oh, no, he's gifted. Yeah. He's got the gift. He's got the gift. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, when you think about it, I mean, he is he's he's on his second heart transplant. He really is one one foot in this world and one foot in another. <laughs> no and doubt. No doubt. I think that he uh, he's just a, a super solid dude who is Part of the reason I think that something that I'm sure we'll talk about soon, the Estes method, uh, why that works so well, I think, is because uh, Connor is gifted the way he is. Yeah, but that's gonna... my opinion. I'm sure he would say something different. <laughs> <laughs> you do um, in the show, uh, you do a couple of different techniques. One of them is the Estes method. And the other one with the ping pong balls, that one is the Gansfeld method. Which uh, was very interesting to see both of these get get practice, and and yours uh, was pretty creepy. Um, we're not going to get into that. I want to save that for the audience. They can go and 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 watch the series. But with Connor, um, okay, okay, we'll, we'll we'll get back to Connor in just a second. So at this point, were there any other synchronicities before you guys hop in the car? I, I think at this point we we didn't even know that it was the synchronicities that we were looking for. So there there may have been, but it was really more of a matter of we were excited to get in the car and actually go. It wasn't really until we were in the car that the synchronicities really started to kick up and we realized something else was going on. So what happens? Um, yeah, what happens next? We are – it this is the really interesting part. Carl and Connor and Rashad were listening to an audiobook of uh, the Mothman Prophecies on their way out from Colorado. Mistake. Just to something to listen to, kind of get them in the mood, you know, right? <laughs> mistake. Mistake. <laughs> right, Just right. A mistake. Okay. Yes, okay. And as we're on our way to Hellier, uh, Carl, Connor's driving. Carl is flipping through uh, Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, which is this book that had the reference to Terry Wrist in it. He's flipping through uh, the interview, and one of the things that they mention uh, to run through the cipher is uh, the, the phrase ink and black. It was then that he, he put two and two together and realized that relates to Indrid Cold who was such a big figure when it comes to the Mothman prophecies and Point Pleasant and you know uh, that that whole investigation. And so immediately then it's like, oh, wow, we listened to this on the way. It was like we were being prepared to find out this piece of information that no one had put two and two together. And all of a sudden, the case is so much bigger because it somehow involves Indrid Cold, who Terry Wrist claimed in the interview – he had used the cipher to find out where Indrid Cold was and met him and talked to him. So now it has a connection to Keel. It has a connection to the Mothman Prophecies case, which really was what launched all of the high strangeness on our way into Hellier. Keep going because this is really, really, really cool. And uh, before you guys get to Hellier, you guys are having this conversation in the car and things are starting to unfold. What what happens next before you get to town? Uh, Carl informs us that uh, Indrid Cold is now somehow tangentially related to this case, which blows our minds. We're all stunned by this because it's it, now it doesn't seem like it's just this little contained thing. I mean, we'd had these ideas. And so as we're talking about all of this, uh, we realize that maybe we should start paying attention to these synchronicities because the only real reason that anyone knew that this had anything to do with anything is because they had started to listen to the Mothman prophecies on the way. Uh, and so the first thing we did when we get to town is we pull out all of the file folders and we start going over this and we realize we probably didn't 
pack in enough time <laughs> to do everything we were going to want to do on this investigation. The uh, I'm not going to give away any spoilers here, but the John Keel part of this story is an intriguing one. And when you get to episode five, as things are resolving, where that John Keel synchronicity, right, happens, Connor picks up a book. You guys are at your apartment. I, I, no spoilers here. But he just happens to, you know, it's a book of John Keel stories and whatever. Uh-huh. And and there it is uh, in like two sentences. Uh, the last, uh, what happens to you at the end? And that was, that was pretty trippy where in that, and I want to get back to you guys arriving in Hellier, but that in of itself is so bleeping specific, no spoilers, Uh but it's so specific (laughs) where you just got to step back and go, wait a minute here. You know, that that's bizarre summed up the case. Totally, 100%. Uh, uh, synchronicities, man. Uh, synchronicities. You just don't ignore them. Okay, let's go back. You guys pull into town. And uh, before the break, we're going to get to uh, Connor and what happens with him on the front porch. But you guys pull into town. Yeah, so we pull into town and we basically try to recreate the same uh, situation that we did last time. So we go to the same gas station. We, you know, kind of park out far, out front and, and look friendly, at, you know, and sort of <laughs> try not to be super weird talking to people about aliens and uh, potential goblins. And we have a oddly different experience than we did the first time. Uh, the first time we were there, people were really excited to talk to us. They had stories that they wanted to tell us. And it took a little bit of prodding and poking when we originally, or when we got there, because a lot of people just sort of, uh, you know, I think, I think it was partially the fact that we had cameras with us and maybe we were a bigger group of people and they were kind of suspicious about who we were, but there weren't a lot of people the first night who were really willing to tell us if they were even having strange things happening on their property. The one thing that we, we did uh, get was a a warning from someone. Oh yeah. Telling us to be careful and, and, not to kind of go off into minds with people and to, you know, be aware of our, you know, where we were, our don't surroundings. Follow, if anyone tells you what, what, that they, they have the answer to something, don't follow don't them. Follow don't them. follow them out into the woods. Yeah. Watch yourselves, <laughs> which was super scary. Yeah. And I mean, the, again, the first time we had been to town, everyone was really happy to talk to us. Everyone was super excited about sharing their stories. And then the second time we have people telling us to be careful and we were kind of getting, you know, the, the evil eye from people and, and it doesn't feel super, super fun. It it feels kind of scary. And it felt a a little bit hostile that very first night kind of standing out there trying to get people to talk to us. And, and with Hellier, uh, this is where I started to freak out a little bit in that, look, I've seen the movie deliverance, right? And, and and I say that a little bit in jest, but one thing is for sure is is Hellier is isolated. It's by itself, and you guys are up there. You're a long ways from help, and if anything stupid or freaky or anything jumps off, you guys are on your own, right? And And you are truly the outsiders in this town coming into their bubble of... of you know, safeness. This is, you are, you are in their world now. Exactly. That was very apparent that first night back. We, we were all kind of looking at each other uh, and really feeling how isolated we were. We were feeling um, how out of place we were. And um, it it was, it it was intimidating. I mean, it is a a small town and it is, um, you know, in the middle of nowhere and everyone does know each other. And 
they really do kind of look suspicious at you if they don't know who you are. And, and, you know, when you're that far away from, um, civilization, it can, it can be incredibly intimidating. And we definitely did not look like we no, were from the area. We did no. not. <laughs> stuck out like, yeah, yeah. yeah, totally, totally, totally. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and that's it. And you have to respect those boundaries because Absolutely. they are around each other all day long. They know everybody there and their personality. They know everybody's life. They know everything about everything. You guys are disruptors. That's mm-hmm. you know that's yeah. that's the way that uh, that you know you you are uh, their 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 way of life, their daily thing. You guys are now uh, uh, what's the word that I want to you know? There's a consistency that goes on there day to day. You guys show up, oh yeah, and that changes for them. So. Yeah. Well, now, and one of the things that we we didn't really even think about this too much until Hellier had come out, because we've heard a lot from the locals who have even more stories to tell. Uh, one of the things that, you know, they've been these types of places are exploited mm-hmm. quite often. People go to these towns and they they uh, reiterate this stereotype of the dumb hillbilly mm-hmm. in their media and these people are very cautious of it because these types of people have gone through this before. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of them go and they live there and they stay there because they are left alone, because no one's going to bother them. So this group of city slicker kids you know, come into town and start asking some questions and pointing cameras at them, and immediately they're going to be suspicious. So we had that really – that was stacked against us from the get-go. Now, uh, two things happen next. I, I believe – uh, they're in order. Uh, it's all running together for me now. But of of course, it's it's Connor with the Estes test. Um, was yeah. that on the first night? I think it was the first night mm-hmm. that we went to the cabin. Yeah. We That's right. The cabin okay. in the area, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we felt kind of uh, you know Dana did a, a little ritual because we thought okay you know we felt like we'd hit a, a brick wall. There were there were things here and there. Uh, somebody had told us that you know their son had found a three-toed footprint. They wanted to show us it, uh, but for that day we were just kind of tapped out. So we went back to the cabin. And we regrouped and we started to think about theories and and what this could be. What was the next step? Where do we go? Do we go to the town hall tomorrow? Whatever. And as we're sitting there, we just got this idea where we're we're on the mountain. We're in this area. uh, We're in the middle of nowhere in this cabin. Why don't we just go outside and we'll just make our presence known because we're coming at this from people who are are from a, a ghost ghosty background. We've investigated poltergeists. You know, we have a, a museum of haunted objects. We really come at it from that perspective. And it's always important to set your intentions when you go into a haunted house, because that really dictates the kind of experience you're going to get. We're of the mindset that a lot of this uh, activity, uh, it's all connected. You know, you do it long enough and you figure you start to see the patterns. Bigfoot uh, investigators uh, are really experiencing stuff that a lot of, you know, ufologists experience. And sometimes some ufologists are experiencing things that ghost hunters experience. So we went into it with the idea that this is all connected. Let's do what we know how to do. Let's set our intentions. Dana did a little ritual. And then uh, we had some strange activity. And once with that kicked up. Connor sat down and decided to do the Estes method, which is one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. Um, if people are familiar with a lot of the ghost hunting television shows and and paranormal investigate paranormal investigators, they know that uh, ghost boxes are all the rage. Uh, they're these devices that sweep through radio frequencies uh, at a rapid rate, and sometimes a word gets spit out. Now, I need to preface this by saying I hate ghost boxes. I think it's one of the worst forms of ITC. I think that they uh, give tons of false positives, especially when there's a group of people who are all convincing each other that they are hearing the same thing. Right. I never took it seriously until I saw the way that Carl and Connor uh, came up with this method of using it, which employs a lot of old parapsychological techniques. So the way that this works is, you take a, a, a ghost box. They use an SB7 spirit box, uh, a pair of specific drumming headphones. Uh, Connor's a drummer in a Colorado punk band called the Ghoulies. So he used his drumming headphones, which block out 20 decibels worth of noise. And they plug it straight into the SB7. 
Connor puts on uh, 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 an eye mask. So the idea is he can't hear anything. He can't see anything. All he hears are these radio frequencies sweeping. He acts as a receiver. Somebody else asks as the questioner. What's really compelling to me is when somebody is asking questions that Connor can't hear, and he's only spitting out the words he hears on the spirit box, and he starts answering those questions, sometimes having a full-on conversation. Exactly. So for the audience, I want you to understand, as opposed to everybody in the room and the spirit, and everybody can hear everything, and 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 seriously uh, pollute and contaminate what they are doing here. Connor is isolated. He can't hear the questions that are being asked. He can't see. He can't see expressions. He can't do anything. He can only listen to the spirit box. You guys are asking the questions. He has no idea what's going on. That is pretty scientific. That's a good method. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's kind of a double blind thing. Uh, and, and it's, it, and that was the first time that I, I was so stunned because I'd seen them do it. They had a, a web series, fantastic web series called Spirits of the Stanley, uh, which they, they shot at the Stanley Hotel. And it's, you can actually see them coming up with this method as it progresses. Uh, this was the first time I'd seen it in person and I was absolutely blown away blown because away. what starts to happen is Connor's predicting the future. He's actually predicting things that are going to happen to us within 30 seconds. And I was losing my mind because I'd never seen anything like it. It was <laughs> trippy, the right? best way I can describe it is it, like technologically assisted mediumship, yes. almost like channeling. Yes, yes, yes. I was I was just just I was there. I was there. I, I could not stop. <laughs> and now uh, we've got two minutes to the break. And a key thing now, uh, uh, again, no spoilers here, <laughs> but uh, everybody's got to go and watch episode five. We've uh, we've only teased you up to this point. There is so much uh, stuff that is going on. Um, believe it or not, there's so much more. But <laughs> at this point, he says, uh, OK, I've. You you tell he he mentions an object. It's safe to mention the object. Nobody's going to know until they see uh, episode five. But what does he say? In the moment, Connor has a very distinct visual image that pops directly into his mind, and he doesn't really know why, but he sees uh, a tin can, Un- a really specific bullet. tin can. Yeah. Yep. And and now, okay, so everybody just kind of hold on to that thought. And when you see uh, when you see the series, you'll know what happens from there. But it happens. He is predicting the future. And and this is something else that uh, I've got to mention this last year at East City Ranch. I had a daytime UFO sighting with with a group of people. Right. There was uh, many people around me. And uh, it was 14 miles away behind uh, Mount Adams. But are you ready? I've described it as the beer can. Oh, see, that's <laughs> that's really interesting. Again, yes, because, yes, because this popped up in Hellier. And uh-huh. I, and look, you guys don't know about this. I haven't talked to you about this. But mm-hmm. when this oh. popped up in Hellier, I was like... <laughs> Um, dialing Greg, 1-800-Greg-Newkirk, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, that's what happened. Wow. And, uh, pre- pretty, pretty funny, uh, at that moment, uh, Greg, you know, exactly what part of, uh, the series that I called you in because we talked about it, but that's where it was. Huh? And, wow. and I, I'm just going to leave it right there. The audience knows about the daytime sighting. You've got to go and watch Hellier. We're going to take a break right here. When we come back, we're going to we're going to continue this journey. It gets nuts. It gets nuts. The Tin Can. Our guest tonight, Greg and Dana Newkirk. Of course, we're talking about their new five-part cinematic documentary series, Hellier, directed by Carl Pfeiffer. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station. 
Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Poor water quality is a major health issue, and it's only getting worse. Municipalities can't keep up, standards have dropped, and pollutants are increasing. Where does it all end? It ends by keeping the pollutants outside of your home with HydroCare's advanced systems available at Wave Home Solutions. No less than the best purification materials and processes have been developed by HydroCare to provide you with healthy, clean water for drinking, cooking, and showering. HydroCare far surpasses the competition in removing chlorine, odors, iron, lead, chemicals, lime scale, and much more. Don't settle for less when it comes to your water. We'll take care of the toughest water problems for you, whether it's from a city or well source. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, call 888-997-WAVE. That's 888-997-WAVE. Or go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics, KGRARadio.com. Does your basement or crawl space have a damp, musty smell? Well, watch out. That's a sign of too much moisture and not enough ventilation. And that can mean increased mold growth and the buildup of harmful toxins and gases. Don't bother with a dehumidifier. It just circulates the same unhealthy air. Now there's a better way to remove these dangers and odors. It's with the computerized Wave Moisture Control Unit that reduces moisture and expels pollutants. We replaced our old dehumidifier with the Wave unit, and in only three weeks, our basement is dry and the musty smell is gone. Wave units require no maintenance, no buckets of water or filters, and costs only pennies a day to run. Breathe better, live healthier with an affordable, no-maintenance Wave unit. Call 888-717-WAVE, 888-717-WAVE, or visit dryhealthyhome.com, dryhealthyhome.com. Ride the This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B blend. So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. That's right. You need to check out Hellier. That's all I've got to say. I was, I was told, and 
uh, you know, the the email, the comments, the tweets uh, about, uh, you know, that uh, that this was out, that I needed to go check it out. And the excitement around it uh, has been it's been pretty cool. How has the reception been uh, to hell you so far? Uh, I mean, it's been great. It's fantastic. I think anyone who watches it will know that it's not made for your typical paranormal television viewer. Uh, there's some concepts in it that are a little bit different. There are things that, you know, they're not new by any means. I mean, people like, you know, Jacques Vallée and John Keel, uh, people that we really respect and have read a lot. There are a lot of those types of concepts. And it's been really awesome to see who it resonates with and what type of person it resonates with. Uh, it's, you know, there's always going to be the, this isn't a spoiler so much, but there's always going to be a group of people who won't be happy until we come out of a cave uh, triumphantly dragging a dead goblin with uh, automatic weapons slung over our shoulders. But uh, uh, that does not exactly happen. Uh, there's, there is a crescendo. But uh, it's not your typical paranormal media. No, it's a great ending. Um, and and well, you know, okay, let's do a little let's let's do a little teaser here for everybody. In that, <laughs> um, there there has to be a part two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I mean, one of the things we've been saying is that Hellier was really a prologue. It was. Uh, it was the beginning and uh, we have to continue uh, along the investigation. One of the things that became clear to us, because when we set out to, to, to shoot Hellier, we didn't know what it was going to be. Uh, it originally was going to be a documentary, like an hour and a half documentary. And when we realized how big and expansive this case was, uh, what people have to keep in mind is they're seeing things as they unfold. So we we show a lot in Hellier that you don't normally see in a lot of this media. We show the actual investigation, right. the highs and the lows and the dead ends. This was the start of something much bigger. And what happens in the final episode, uh, particularly in the last 30 seconds or so, um, we've had questions where people say, you know, did that really happen? Yeah, it did. It's not there to be cute. Hellier had a different ending until February. Uh, and at that point we knew, okay, this is huge. And the second season is going to be so much bigger and so much more expansive. And we're far more prepared this time than we were the first time. There, there are indications throughout, uh, the first four episodes leading into five, uh, starting with the first episode that this is, a, a big deal. It's a big case. It's complex. It's not anything which you thought it was ultimately going to be. And there was a lot of uh, secrecy and cloak and dagger uh, bizarro moments uh, in each episode that shows you uh, as as the viewer how big and how wide this is. It's not a simple case of... Uh, you know, some some goblins or, or ETs playing in the backyard uh, with the children's toys. It's uh, it's much, much bigger than that, which takes me to this. There is a moment of clarity uh, that you guys go through <laughs> <laughs> while sitting around uh, and talking and uh, who had the uh, who had the ISP idea first? W was it you, Greg, it was, or was it? No, it was Rashad. It was Rashad, uh, the, right? The cameraman. He don't you don't see much of him, but he really is kind of the unsung hero of Hellier because he's the guy who was holding the camera the entire time. That's all he did. And he's looking at uh, the email. I'm going to let you tell the story, but he's speaking to you. And that's what it was, right? You're sitting down. He's speaking to you. Um, and he's looking at who, whose email is he, is he looking at? So he's looking at uh, the email from David Christie. And we're, we're sitting around. Again, it was another one of those moments where there's you know, a dead end. And then there's a dangling carrot. And we follow the carrot. And then there's a dead end. And, and this, this keeps happening. It's a continuous thing. Something's pushing us or directing us somewhere. 
and we're frustrated. We're at the cabin and we're just kind of sitting around trying to figure out what the next step is. And Rashad says, you know, it says here, I'm, I'm just Googling around. It says you might be able to trace this email. You might be able to trace this IP address and figure out where this came from. Uh, and so there was this mad dash where everybody, you know, all the cameras turned on and we sat down and we started to trace these emails. Now, why didn't you, why didn't you do this before? Never occurred to us. I never knew you could do such a thing. Um, I'm, I'm not a techie. Uh, I had no clue. So it was, it's a good example of like, a gr- the right group of people. Right. You know what I mean? Where you just have that one person who, m- m- you know, Rashad may not have had a background in paranormal investigation, but he, in that moment he was like, Oh wait, why don't we try this? And it just, we were like, why didn't any of us think about that? Of course, that's what we should try. Now, so it was sort of this like perfect moment. And, and, uh, spoiler alert, Dana's sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> Dana's <laughs> sitting there listening to this conversation. And I'm watching, you're not saying much, Dana, but I can see the wheels are turning, <laughs> right? What what, what were you thinking at that moment? I mean, were you at a holy crap moment? That Yes, that's the best way to describe it. it I, I think you're actually watching me process <laughs> the right. realization. I'm processing everything, and it's like... I don't think I was aware of even being on camera. I don't think that I, I think I was like literally in that holy crap moment where I was just like, what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. I'm just experiencing it. You can see it on my face. I thought you were about to tip over the coffee table. That's where I thought it was going. (laughs) So, (laughs) and and I'm sure that that is right where you were. Okay. So now (laughs) you get your uh, IT guy on the phone uh, who happens to pick up at two o'clock in the morning. What was his name? Uh, that was uh, Steve. Steve uh, was one of um, uh, Carl and Connor's friends who uh, worked on their series of Spirits of the Stanley. He's one of their investigator friends who happens to be uh, an IT professional. And, you know, he's a he's a ghost hunter. And plus, you know, it's it's three two three hours uh, previous where we are. So he he answers the phone and we start running things by him we're forwarding emails to him he's doing his magic and without spoiling too much the the location of the emails was not anywhere we anticipated them to be and it was an immense bomb a, no, like, it was like it was, a bomb had gone off. Yeah, it was like a bomb had gone off. Now, I'm not going to give away because it's such a special moment. Everybody's just got to go and watch. It's like 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long. It's pretty intense. Um, but there was one uh, instance that we can't talk about, and that is the first ISP location was mm-hmm. n- was near you guys up in Canada. It was about two hours north of where we were living at the time. In Toronto. And in, it, it was in Toronto, right on the outskirts of Toronto. And we uh, kind of had a meltdown. Yeah, kind of. Because it was a- kind of. You should have. <laughs> and, and this is, see, now this is what, um, now I put myself immediately in your shoes at that moment. Because at, because it gets so twisted, and suddenly the email address didn't necessarily come from where you thought, but uh, the opposite, it came out of your own backyard. Now the uh-huh. conspiracy, trippy thoughts start popping into your heads. It had to go that way for you. Dana, is that where you went? Yeah, I mean, that that is the moment where I'm in full paranoia mode i'm just like trying to think of who it could be i'm trying to think of why it would be and and it's funny too because i think the other thing that popped into my head at that moment was the same feeling that i felt years before when we received an email telling us where we had been it was like it was too close to home Mm -hmm. it felt invasive i felt really i felt really like threatened and again that kind of sinister vibe just sort of crept over me in that moment where I felt like it 
it, everything that was happening was like way too close to him. And I felt like I was being played with. And I, that was a, in that moment, that was a really horrible uh, feeling because a violation. It, it felt like a violation. Exactly. If, if, if Greg could have had WTF tattooed on his forehead, that was the moment. Well, I mean, I think in, even in the series, you, uh, you you hear me say a few words I can't say on the radio. Right, right. I, I say say, but I scream them, really. <laughs> <laughs> and that this was one of those moments. And so we'll save it, and, and, and what happens next, uh, everybody can go and watch it. But the uh, there's as you guys are, are pulling this apart, you guys go back and look at dates and locations, and you know that you guys were actually in Canada where this email may or may not have originated from a small town just north of Toronto when you guys were in mm-hmm. Canada. And mm-hmm. uh, Dana says it right. Uh, paranoia, suspicions. Oh, did you guys hear that? Was that you? Yeah. Yeah. No. no. Wow. Are you are you serious? That was really I'm loud, at, dude, too. I, yeah, what was that? I don't know. I'm underground. I thought it came from you guys. No. Okay. I was. <laughs> Get out of here. All right. Okay. See, now, now I'm losing my mind again. Uh, yeah, because again, know, right? The stuff that happens in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are looking at me on the camera. They know I'm just sitting <laughs> here, and that sounded like a growl. That, yeah. That was yeah. trippy in stereo, too, as well. That was. Uh, Okay, anyway, I've got to go back and listen to that. Look, everybody God. in Twitter, what the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. Weird sound. What? Okay, yeah, that was uh that was uh that was bizarro. Okay. Um uh in that uh, this is coming from a small town and you guys are doing the old triangulation of time and events and when it when it hits that close to home greg for you the male side were you thinking pragmatically here were you thinking black and white or were you like you know holy crap okay this is this is like getting sinister where where was your mind at that moment well the first thing i did was i started racking my brain to everyone that we knew in canada all the researchers we'd had run-ins with canada uh you know anybody um it's not a Huge secret to say that I have a uh, I have a, a good rogues gallery of enemies. <laughs> right. I used to yes. run a website called Who Forded, and uh, I pretty much made it my goal to frustrate and irritate as many people in the paranormal community as possible. Uh, and the first thing I did was I started to rack my brain and think of who is messing with me. Who did I? Who did I make upset? Who is who's doing this? And I couldn't I I I couldn't narrow it down to anybody. And and I was lost. I mean, at that point, I was absolutely lost because I had no idea what to make of it. Um, there were just too many things that didn't add up. And uh, I frankly kind of wanted to cry <laughs> or scream. One of the two. Right, right. That was an eye-opening moment and uh, a special moment too. Uh, which, again, opens up all of this into a wider situation, certainly how things end up resolving, and then obviously there has to be a season two because all of this is tied together. I did want to ask you this. While you guys were in the cabin, anything strange happen? I'm trying to think of anything overtly weird, uh, not necessarily in the cabin yeah, itself. It was pretty outside. much outside. I mean, there was stuff that that knew what we were doing and knew we were there and uh, felt very uh, elemental, I think is the best way to put it. Uh, so there was definitely stuff going on outside the cabin, whether it had anything to do with the cabin or the fact that we were there and we specifically – put our intentions out into this land to say okay we're here we want answers what's going on Mm -hmm. uh that i don't know now uh what you guys spent seven days in town yeah about about a week yeah okay about a week Mm -hmm. what night was the email isp night that was the night before we left yeah right right yeah okay the night before we left and so leading up to all of this, uh, the next day, uh, which is episode five, 
I'll just let everybody yeah. know that's episode five, and I have chosen not to go there because it's a it's a special episode that ties everything together. But this leads into episode five. Uh, did you guys know what you were going to do in the morning? I don't think we did. I quite. think we, we had ideas. Yeah, I think that we we knew what we wanted to be doing, but we weren't sure whether or not we were actually going to be doing it. The uh, the thing about Hellier is we thought we were going to be doing one thing when we ended up there. We thought, uh, I think even Connor sums this up perfectly. We thought we were going to be hanging out in some guy's backyard waiting for goblins to come out of a mine shaft. That's what we thought we were going to be doing. We were utterly unprepared for what we really ended up doing uh, and unprepared for the revelations that came from what we were going to be doing. We thought it was going to be pretty cut and dry and it was anything but uh, everything that happens in the fifth episode, everything that unravels and uh, you know, specifically the way that this, the first season ends um, we were unprepared for. Mm -hmm. We had no concept of what was coming. Okay. I do want to discuss one thing uh, that happens in episode five uh, for me that's not part of episode five uh, directly, but it is your uh, ping pong balls. And, and, <laughs> and what, I, what I want to discuss is what, because for me it was a very uh, uh, terrifying uh, situation. I don't like uh being in a situation that I can't control and you are voluntarily uh put in something that you cannot control you don't know what's going to happen or what what you are going to see um and so for everybody tell them exactly how this uh is is prepared because it I, I want everybody to visually understand uh, what you're going through, how the balls are placed, uh, the lights, and so forth. So one of the things that we did uh, because of the way that we were researching this phenomena and because it felt like one of these things where uh, you know the you know, psychic phenomena was obviously coming into play, there were a lot of different things that uh, uh, were, were – we wanted to explore every avenue. So one of the things that we did is we did an old parapsychological – experiment called the the Gansfeld experiment and the way that you perform this is you you take two uh, ping pong balls and you use medical tape to seal up the edges and you put it around your eyes so the only thing your eyes can see is kind of this milky opaqueness and then you uh, you take a pair of um, red lights and you shine the red lights mm -hmm. on them so it almost feels like what you're seeing is something like almost like with your eyes closed. And there's a light on your eyes. Uh, it's just to make sure that you can't see anything. And then you use a pair of headphones and you pump in white noise. So it's just kind of the television static sort of noise. And you relax yourself as much as possible. And then you just sort of zone out. And the theory behind this is that when all of your senses are shut down, when everything is closed down, uh, your your sixth sense, your potential psychic abilities kick in uh, and, and you can use them better because you're not overwhelmed by you know, audio sensitivity and visual sensitivity. So you're isolated. You hear nothing, you see nothing, and you're just laying there trying, attempting to be comfortable. And it doesn't take very long before you do this when the visions begin. Do you know how terrifying that is to watch? It's it's absolutely <laughs> terrifying, and so you are telling me, Dana. Next question is to you. <laughs> you are telling me that you are your eyes are open, looking at this opaque red uh, milkiness, listening to white noise. Right? How stupid is that? Right? I mean, it, I mean, it, it, it sounds crazy, uh, and and it. It's funny because when you're even when you're doing it, it feels terrifying because you don't know what you're going to see and you That's don't know it. what you're going to experience. That's it. That's it. And so for you, Dana, looking at your better half going mm -hmm. through that, 
it, it's got to be pretty unsettling for you. Pretty, uh, pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, on top of that, we were in a location that wasn't necessarily safe. Uh, you know, it was summer, so there's <laughs> spiders and potentially poisonous snakes everywhere. So, like. I'm maybe at, goblins. Maybe go- I'm, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm literally at like an 11 in my, on the stress meter at this point in time because I'm trying to keep my eyes on everything. Um, because, again, yeah, like Greg is completely isolated. He's he, he's cut off from the world at this point in time. So I, we have to be his eyes and his ears because he's going to be experiencing things and he's not going to be able to know, um, you know, if some, if a board is about to crash down on him or if, you know, if something is going to come out of the, the uh, space around us. So we were all really, really stressed out, but I was definitely – definitely pushing uh you know at 11 or 12 yeah as a viewer i was pushing 11 or 12 and then uh everybody can go and watch it the session ends but greg you are uh visually disturbed what at, yeah. at, what was going through you took many many minutes uh to uh orient yourself and you went through something very terrifying. Uh, you can uh, go and watch and see. It was, but I want to know what was going on in your mind at that moment. When you sat up, you took off the headphones. You sat there with the ping pong balls on for a few minutes. You didn't even make a move there. I would have ripped them off. What was going through your um, mind? What what happened, uh, you know, people can see exactly how it went down. But the session ended before it was supposed to. Um, something stopped the session and it stopped it at a, a pretty frightening moment, um, where things were going to, they, they certainly seemed like they were going to progress to a place that was going to be, uh, pretty frightening and something stopped it. The white noise actually stopped, I think like 15 minutes or so before it was supposed to. So something pulled me out of the session. And I had to process that for a minute because not only what I was experiencing was frightening and fairly extreme, but the fact that something decided, no, we're not going to let that happen was also frightening. So I'm, you know, my experience in Hellier was just constantly processing fear and confusion uh, <laughs> basically for a week and this you know was it just another another chance to do that it was a, a very intense moment and which um i'm you know again i'm leaving episode five off of the table i just wanted to know uh how you guys were were dealing with that emotionally both you know dana's witnessing what is going down and and so is connor and rashad and carl i mean they're all standing there watching this very very stressful uh 15 18 minute period or whatever it was uh but for you i i just had to know i that i can't imagine uh what your nerves were like coming out of that because you sat there for a while pretty disoriented yeah and then to come out of it and have them say uh there were things whispering to us yeah while you were doing this (laughs) Like, oh, I missed man. all of that. Yeah, <laughs> man. Uh, we were, uh, everybody, we were talking about all of that stuff off of the air. That was uh, that was an intense, that's, uh, that's really well done. All right, uh, you know what? I'm not ready to wrap up. You guys want to do some overtime? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are too cool. All right, let's, uh, let's take a break right here. Our guests tonight are Greg and Dana Newkirk, of course. We are talking about their new docu-series. It's called Hellier. It's on Amazon. You can also click on the links over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hellier.tv is right there. It's streaming there. You've got to go and check it out. And uh, we're just going to continue this conversation. It's Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All Numana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the Numana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go back Lee Tappy. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and my family is safe because of Numana Emergency Food Storage. Just go to the Numana banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code Jimmy10. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. Heading into some overtime with tonight's guests, Greg and Dana Newkirk. Discussing their new docu-series. It's called Hellier. It's on Amazon, and you can go and check it out there. And, of course, Hellier.tv is uh, uh, it's streaming there, and it's a great website, cast and crew, and and uh, 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 everything Hellier is there. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's do a little after-show stuff. Uh, the series premieres, and with that, uh, every every strange thing starts to come out of the woodwork and you have to start to wade through this. Uh, How extensive was that? 
Oh, I mean, we we haven't even scratched the surface now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been unbelievable. Um, my inbox every day is is just constantly getting, you know, personal stories from Eastern Kentucky. Uh, you know, people who want to help with, you know, something else, or people who've experienced something similar in a completely different part of the country. So we have our work cut out for us. And what about uh, the other side, which would be? Uh, people claiming to be from Hellier or know something about this case and uh, and they need to reach out to you. How much of that happened? I think about as much as we kind of expected. And, um, you know, it's 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 just a matter of kind of doing our due diligence and really going through each one of those emails and each one of those messages with the fine tooth comb and sort of, you know, looking for signs that they potentially could be, you know, from people who are just trying to hoax us, which is, we were fully expecting that. So we were kind of ready for it. We'd had uh, a meeting before it came out, you know, we, we keep in close touch with Carl and Connor and we knew that as soon as Hellier dropped, uh, we were going to experience some of that. We were prepared for it. And there's a lot of information about the case uh, that we still have kept to ourselves. So it's one of the easiest ways to know who's telling the truth and who's not. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it, like I said earlier in the show, there's fake David Christie Facebook pages that have popped up and uh, people have tried to point us to them. But it's pretty obvious the people who are telling the truth uh, and the people who aren't just because – We've we still got some details that we've we've kept secret. Now, has anybody uh, stepped forward out of Hellier uh, to that that you have vetted that does have something to add to this case? Oh, there's I mean dozens. There's dozens of people who've emailed who who used to live in in Hellier or at least in the greater Pikeville area uh, that have similar experiences. Um, people who you know claim to have had th- three toed footprints, and you know they know that they can take us to a place where they saw these things, or people that have seen you know UFOs. Uh, one of the really interesting things we started to notice uh, towards the end of our time in Hellier, and I, I think this is barely touched on in the series, is uh, there was this strange phenomena that we started to experience where someone – we'd ask them, hey, have you ever seen anything strange out here? And they'd be like, well, what are you talking about? And we'd be like, well, you know, UFOs or strange creatures or anything like that. And they'd go, no, never. I lived here all my life and I've never seen anything like that. And then we're just, you know, shooting the crap with them. 15 minutes later, they go, well, there was that one time that that, you know, gigantic UFO hovered over the football field back in the 70s and everybody kind of stared at it and didn't know what to do. That type of thing happened Mm -hmm. so much it started to become obvious to us that something was going on with people's memories. There's even a moment in the series concerning uh, David's house or the house we at least thought was David's where we even noticed that something was wrong. We couldn't remember things. Uh, That has only continued to get worse the more we've dug into this case. And it almost feels like there's some sort of an external force erasing things. And what do you do uh, with that? Uh, You both can answer this in that you go into this feeling one way, you know, a couple of years before uh, and and the emails and the evidence that came in. And as things started to unfold, Mm -hmm. you had elements of every single segment of the paranormal and supernatural and science are all like uh, coming together and these dots are starting to get connected. How did you, how did you start to process that? Because it, it led you in so many different directions, but yet it was all related. It was oddly comforting to me. uh, Mostly just because at that point in time, you know, for Greg and I, we had kind of dipped our toes in a lot of different avenues of the paranormal we had investigated bigfoot we had uh you know gone uh, out with ufologists and and so it, at that point in time it was really kind of comforting for me to to be coming to this realization that it is all connected and that it is all um the same thing and that you know all of these different experiences that we were having they were all 
we were having them for a reason. There was some, there was, it was the phenomena trying to get us to, to acknowledge it. And, and for me, it was very comforting. I don't know. Greg might have a different answer. I mean, it's overwhelming for me. I mean, it might be comforting to Dana, but it's a bit (laughs) overwhelming to me because, uh, you know, when you, we'd slowly gotten to the point where we realized that it seem it certainly seems like most paranormal phenomena is connected in some way, whether that's a mental way, whether that's a spiritual way. I, I don't really know that we're still we're still trying to figure that out for ourselves. Um, but when you get to that point where you're like, oh, OK, so this is connected to this and this is connected to this and something that feels greater than us is pushing us in a direction. It's a bit overwhelming because you know, my, the, my intelligent half goes, should we be doing this? Should we be paying attention to, should we be following this? Because you don't know what's on the other end. And it happens over and over. It's, it's very interesting to see how you guys uh, deal with this. Uh, any, you know, we, we keep bringing up uh, ufology, we're bringing up Bigfoot and we're bringing up uh, uh, cryptids. Uh, we're bringing up ghosts. We're talking about goblins, right? These are don't seem to be connected at all, but yet mm-hmm. they are. Clearly, uh, if you start to ignore this, then you are going to miss the big picture and possibly the answers that you're seeking, right? Well, that's the thing that I, I love so much about Hellier as a project is, you know, there's a problem. And and this is something that anyone who's been in the paranormal field for long enough, and even people who are watching from the outside, if you pay attention, you'll notice this problem. And the problem is Bigfoot hunters don't talk to ufologists. Ufologists don't talk to ghost hunters. Uh, it, there's this um, – it's almost like a feeling like – Okay, I hunt Bigfoot, but at least I don't believe in aliens. At <laughs> right. least I'm not an idiot who believes in ghosts, that type of thing, you know? Right, and right. a lot of Bigfoot hunters are very flesh and blood. A lot of ufologists are very nuts and bolts. If these people shared information with each other and they did cross over once in a while, they'd notice that some of the stuff that they're experiencing is so similar to one another, they're just viewing it through their own lenses. And so I think that's one of the coolest things about Hellier is it shows that there is crossover. And it's uh, it's woken a lot of people up to that idea. You know, people were confused. They're like, why are they using, you know, parapsychology equipment to talk to goblins? I don't understand. But as they watch, they start to realize, oh, they're doing that because there's really not a big difference between this stuff. And so uh, it's it's different than what people would expect, uh, especially people who are fans of paranormal television. When they're very used to very cut and dry three act structure, there's a goblin, there's a town. We're going to go. We're going to interview people. We're going to do an investigation. We're going to find a goblin. It doesn't work like that. Because that's really not how paranormal investigation works. Uh, it is a series of of twists and turns and dead ends and carrots. And sometimes the answers that you get aren't convenient for your own worldview. And I think showing that is really important. There was something else that uh, kept coming up uh, throughout the series. And I want your reaction to this. I heard over and over and over again three years ago, right? Mm. Three years ago, this happened. Well, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, but three years ago, three years ago, three years ago. And I, and I was sitting there going, well, that's kind of about the time the first email came in and that's kind Mm -hmm. of about the time here. And this so, uh, what did, did you pick up on that? Oh Yeah. Uh, I think the question that we left Hellier with is, is this cyclical? Is this something, is the phenomena cyclical? Um, And it seems to, to, to appear to us that it is. And, you know, one of the things that Carl in particular has done, and you see glimpses of this in the series, is he has a map. And he's been pinpointing things with dates and areas and locations and lots of red yarn. And it's getting to the point where I think the big question now is if if it is cyclical and we can pinpoint these things and where these things are happening and we can figure out a pattern, 
can we get to the point where we can predict the next flap area, where we can predict where this thing is going to emerge next? And I think that's a big part of what we're on to now. Dana, I want to hear your answer to that. This whole three years ago uh, comment, which which seemed to uh, repeat itself, uh, you, you're thinking from a different mindset. What what were you thinking about this this three years ago comment that just kept getting repeated? I look at it as another another synchronicity and another sign, another post. Like what? For me, my brain instantly goes to astrology, and I'm trying to see if there's correlations between you know said date at you know three years ago and and the the date that we're talking about now i feel like all of those things are again they're these signposts that we're supposed to be looking into what was happening at that time it's important to look into what was happening at that time because it's going to give us a lot more insight into what we potentially should be looking for in the future and the the three years ago comments was coming from people that uh it was in different timelines uh, and, and different scenes. They weren't all, you know, grouped together, you know, saying three years ago. This was coming from uh, different sources and different witnesses. But clearly something went down three years ago in Hellier that was uh, pretty significant. And it tied in, you know, to the UFO that was over the town all day long. Uh, mm-hmm. Certainly uh, with a David uh, Christie's email coming into you. It was a, a pretty significant moment for the for the town of Hellier, wasn't it? Well, there's another uh, aspect to this too, where uh, it almost seems like certain actions trigger a certain response, and whatever happened then, uh, something triggered something, and something something triggered all of this phenomena, this high strangeness that was happening in Hellier. One of the things that I can say about where the case is now is it seems very obvious to us now that us going to Hellier triggered something else to happen. And that is has been consistent. And so this idea of things happening on a specific date, um, there's things that will be revealed in the second season that happen on significant dates that we had no idea until until much later. So – uh, dates and times and places are important because they are triggers to starting something else. It's like you just flick a domino and then everything else starts to go. And I think what's really interesting is our experience in Hellier the second time. The reason it's so much different from the first time is because something had changed and we needed to go to Hellier and maybe do something to start or or at least continue that domino effect and it and it continued once we got there and did the thing it continued the okay uh i'm just going to push you guys as as far as i can push you <laughs> okay. uh, 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 when it comes to david christie or or terry wrist have they resurfaced that would be a big spoiler i can't say so they uh, did. All so, I can okay. say is keep watching. Well, yeah, so they did. <laughs> Otherwise, you would say, no, they didn't. So they well, did. Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, okay, let's say <laughs> if let's say if they did, Dana. I'll ask Dana. Greg, <laughs> I'll ask Dana. If they did surface, would you have met them in person? Uh, I think. I, absolutely we would <laughs> uh, i knew i did that the right way i, I think that's the goal well, that's, anyway yeah let's that, back up that, saying that i that think is, the, that the, would be the, the goal, goal is well and i think this is the question are are david and terry the same person i think let's put you on that question well are, that... are david and terry the same person and and how do we know how do we know uh, God, it's so I'm I'm like walking through Landmines, a minefield right yeah. now. How do we know how to find Terry and how do we know he was a real person? I think that is one of the things that we're we're on to now. And finding Terry and finding why 
this happened? That's well. Why that's the, that's no the question. Sent. That's the question. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yeah. Were you able to? I'm excited for 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 part two here. There's no doubt about it. Uh, were you able to go back and and get one of the biggest questions resolved here? Why your original GeoCities website and email? Why was that selected by David or Terry or 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 if you know if there but were you able to get that answer? That's that's hanging out there for me. I will answer your question this way. I don't I I can't give you a certain answer to this. All I can tell you is is what I think now and I think what a lot of us uh in this in this case have come to think is time is not linear. Time is linear for us. So somebody sending me that email back then would have meant nothing. But if someone had a sufficiently uh, far enough view of time, they would know that in a few years we would be in a position where that would mean something. That's exactly and the it, point. I find that so <laughs> bizarrely strange yes. that it was yes. sent to, uh, at that time, on that website to uh, somebody that would later, uh, you know, obviously partner up with Dana and and go off uh, to a very successful uh, paranormal research career and become somebody that is, you know, part of our community. But y mm -hmm. you wouldn't know that going off of that GeoCities website with a bunch of kids with torches and battle axes. Mm -hmm. And right. and there's an, a moment in the fifth episode where we call uh, our really good friend John Tenney. Uh, <laughs> he's great, he's by the way. one of the people that we respect the most in this field. We've learned a lot from him, and he's been around a long time and experienced a lot of stuff. And in a moment of frustration, you know, he's kind of he's he's Gramps. He's who we call when we need some advice. And he says something that has stuck with us uh, continuously. And that is, this will not make sense to you on a linear timeline. These types of things, typically in the paranormal, the longer you do it, the more you realize some things only make sense once you have the right context. So you're getting chunks here and there. So if we are dealing with somebody or something that is more than us, they would have a better idea of how to specifically line things up so that something specific occurs. And I you know what that now. <laughs> can I jump in? Can I jump in? That yes, all that from Tenny was great, but he says something else that just floored me. He goes, and you will lose your mind. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? he's right. He's, yes. he's 100 percent right. Yes, yes. It just floored me. Uh, it, well, congratulations. I mean, the, the series is great. It's, it's so well done. And I think there's a lot in it, uh, for everybody, no matter what part of uh, this community that you come from and, and you research because every, you know, there's a little bit of everything in there, uh, for us all. But when can we, uh, expect, uh, the next installment? Uh, we started shooting it in December. And like I said, it's it's much bigger now. The scope is is much wider, which I think people will get a feel for when they finish the series. Um, so it, I I could assume it would probably come out sometime early next year. It really just depends on what we get onto and uh, how much support the first season gets. So we're we're hard at work. We uh, we're hard at work. Carl is already editing things. He's sending us little. He's the worst because he waits until there's nothing going on and then he'll just go good morning and he'll send us a clip <laughs> that will blow our minds and just make us excited for it to be finished so yeah he's we're so hard at work he's so, he's such an interesting guy and he's also in loveland and our uh conference is uh in loveland over the july 4th weekend our soul tech conference oh, wow. And uh, I would love for wow. him to come up and hang out. That'd be really cool. Uh, you know, Loveland is about the size of my hand, so <laughs> yeah, he can just he yeah. can he can walk there uh, from wherever he lives. <laughs> um, you guys are uh, getting ready to head on the road. Uh, what are you doing? 
We uh, we're getting ready for our 2019 uh, traveling museum of the paranormal in the, in the occult exhibition. So uh, we're on our way to uh, the Queen Mary out in Lo- uh, Long Beach, California, and then the next weekend we're going to be in uh, Hawaii, and then it's just kind of a a full court press for the rest of the year all over the country with uh, our traveling museum. Wait a minute, you're going to be in my backyard this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, I think we get into town uh, Thursday night. Thursday mm-hmm. night, you are going to be at the Queen Mary this weekend, March 8th, 9th, and 10th. You got it. Yeah, with strange escapes. Okay, Rita, we're heading. We're going to have dinner in Long Beach with uh, Dana and Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. I guess yeah, we're heading south. Sure. I guess we're heading south. Let's get that set up. I, I want to check it out. I didn't. You said you were heading west. You didn't say that you were heading into my neighborhood. There's a difference. <laughs> well, it all blends together. You know, uh, the the from spring until fall, we're we live on the road basically. So. Sometimes I forget. Uh, it's a good thing I have Dana to keep my head wrapped around straight. Yeah, I speak. Uh, I speak the same language there. Uh, <laughs> but the um, uh, the dates for the traveling museum are at Weird HQ. Uh, they're actually if you go to paramuseum dot com, you can find all the dates for the rest of the year, and we're adding dates constantly. So if uh, if there, you don't see your town on there, just keep checking. And uh, if you want us somewhere, just let somebody know. We're always down to travel. Absolutely amazing conversation tonight, and and the series is great. Congratulations on that. You guys deserve it. Uh, that is uh, I, the, the the what I got out of it was that you guys just documented the events in a chronological order and and laid it out there so everybody could see this thing unfold from start to finish and you couldn't do that in a 90 minute uh, documentary it had to be it had to be done this way and congratulations sure. on that a labor of love Absolutely. I, I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really meant a lot that you had us on to talk about yeah. it. I really appreciate that. All right. And I guess we'll see you guys. Today's Monday. Safe travels. And we'll see you this weekend down in Long Beach. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you, Dana and Greg Newkirk. Thank you guys so much. Be safe. Safe travels. Amazing conversation tonight. Now, go over to, it's very simple. Go over to jimmychurchradio.com, and you can see Greg and Dana's section on the homepage right there. And Weird HQ and Hellier.tv are at the bottom. And you can also, so you can click on, on both of those. But uh, you can go straight to Amazon and just look up Hellier, and it'll pop up right there. It's uh, it's pretty amazing, and I uh, I was at I was at the point when I was binging it where I was just stopped in my tracks, and I knew at that point that we had to get them on the show. It's it's first off for me, it's too important of a, of a docu series. But the other part is when I do this show night after night, or you know year after year, and I'm talking about all of these subjects. And and I see it play out uh, in this series like I did, I, th- bringing them on to give you the background of this of of everything, so you can go back and watch it, knowing uh, the information that you got from Greg and Dana tonight will make it all that more special. So go and check it out, Hellier on Amazon. And with that, I want to uh, let everybody know what's going on for the rest of the week here. Tomorrow night, Mitch Horowitz is here, and uh, it's going to be a great conversation. And not only are we going to discuss Mitch's uh, two books and what he's working on now, but he's also one of our featured speakers for our Soul Tech conference coming up over the July 4th weekend. So we're going to get a sneak preview on what he is going to be presenting at Soul Tech. Wednesday night is our Soul Tech special event, which is also premiering our new documentary. It is called Boarding Benevolence. That was shot up at Soul Tech 2018 at E. SETI Ranch. And I'm very proud of, of the documentary. And we will have a few very cool uh, special guests uh, on Wednesday night. Thursday night, of course, is another fader night with open lines all night long. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Camarion. 
show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Faded Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, The Planet. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2019 by Faded Black and the Game Changer Network. They cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black of the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody here tomorrow night. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Until then, everybody be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.